This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Silas Marner, The Weaver of Ravelil, by George Eliot. Chapter 8 When Godfrey Cass returned from Mrs. Osgood's party at midnight, he was not much surprised to learn that Dunsey had not come home. Perhaps he had not sold Wildfire, and was waiting for another chance. Perhaps, on that foggy afternoon, he had preferred housing himself at the Red Lion at Batherley for the night, if the run had kept him in that neighbourhood, for he was not likely to feel much concern about leaving his brother in suspense. Godfrey's mind was too full of Nancy Lammeter's looks and behaviour, too full of the exasperation against himself and his lot which the sight of her always produced in him, for him to give much thought to Wildfire, or to the probabilities of Dunstan's conduct. The next morning the whole village was excited by the story of the robbery, and Godfrey, like every one else, was occupied in gathering and discussing news about it, and in visiting the stone pits. The rain had washed away all possibility of distinguishing footmarks, but a close investigation of the spot had disclosed, in the direction opposite to the village, a tinder-box, with a flint and steel, half sunk in the mud. It was not Silas's tinder-box, for the only one he had ever had was still standing on his shelf, and the inference generally accepted was that the tinder-box in the ditch was somehow connected with the robbery. A small minority shook their heads, and intimated their opinion that it was not a robbery to have much light thrown on it by tinder-boxes, that Master Marner's tail had a queer look with it, and that such things had been known as a man's doing himself a mischief, and then setting the justice to look for the doer. But when questioned closely, as to their grounds for this opinion, and what Master Marner had to gain by such false pretenses, they only shook their heads as before, and observed that there was no knowing what some folks counted gain, moreover that everybody had a right to their own opinions, grounds or no grounds, and that the weaver, as everybody knew, was partly crazy. Mr. Macy, though he joined in the defence of Marner against all suspicions of deceit, also pooh-poohed the tinder-box, indeed repudiated it as a rather impious suggestion, tending to imply that everything must be done by human hands, and that there was no power which could make away with the guineas without moving the bricks. Nevertheless, he turned round rather sharply on Mr. Tookey, when the zealous deputy, feeling that this was a view of the case peculiarly suited to a parish clerk, carried it still farther, and doubted whether it was right to inquire into a robbery at all, when the circumstances were so mysterious. As if, concluded Mr. Tookey, as, as if there was nothing but what could be made out by justices and constables. "'Now don't you be overshooting the mark, Tookey,' said Mr. Macy, nodding his head aside admonishingly. "'That's what you're always at. If I throw a stone in it, you think there's summat better than hitting, and you try to throw a stone beyond. What I said was against the tinder-box. I said nothing against justices and constables, for they're a King George's making, and it'd be ill-becoming a man in a parish office to fly out again King George.' While these discussions were going on amongst the group outside the rainbow, a higher consultation was being carried on within, under the presidency of Mr. Crackenthorpe, the rector, assisted by Squire Cass and other substantial parishioners. It had just occurred to Mr. Snell, the landlord, he being, as he observed, a man accustomed to put two and two together, to connect with the tinder-box, which, as deputy constable, he himself had had the honourable distinction of finding, certain recollections of a peddler, who had called to drink at the house about a month before, and had actually stated that he carried a tinder-box about with him to light his pipe. Here, surely, was a clue to be followed out, and as memory, when duly impregnated with ascertained facts, is sometimes surprisingly fertile, Mr. Snell gradually recovered a vivid impression of the effect produced on him by the peddler's countenance and conversation. He had a look with his eye, which fell unpleasantly on Mr. Snell's sensitive organism. To be sure, he didn't say anything particular, no, except that about the tinder-box, but it isn't what a man says, it's the way he says it. Moreover, 
he had a swarthy foreignness of complexion which boded little honesty. "'Did he wear earrings?' Mr. Crackenthorpe wished to know, having some acquaintance with foreign customs. "'Well, stay, let me see,' said Mr. Snell, like a docile clairvoyant, who would not really make a mistake if she could help it. After stretching the corners of his mouth and contracting his eyes, as if he were trying to see the earrings, he appeared to give up the effort, and said, "'Well, he'd got earrings in his box to sell, so it's natural to suppose he might wear em. But he called at every house, almost, in the village. There's somebody else, mayhap, saw em in his ears, though I can't take upon me rightly to say.' Mr. Snell was correct in his surmise that somebody else would remember the peddler's earrings, for on the spread of inquiry among the villagers it was stated with gathering emphasis that the parson had wanted to know whether the peddler wore earrings in his ears, and an impression was created that a great deal depended on the eliciting of this fact. Of course, every one who heard the question, not having any distinct image of the peddler as without earrings, immediately had an image of him with earrings, larger or smaller, as the case might be, and the image was presently taken for a vivid recollection, so that the glazier's wife, a well-intentioned woman, not given to lying, and whose house was among the cleanest in the village, was ready to declare, as sure as ever she meant to take the sacrament the very next Christmas that was ever coming, that she had seen big earrings in the shape of the young moon in the peddler's two ears, while Jinny Oates, the cobbler's daughter, being a more imaginative person, stated not only that she had seen them too, but that they had made her blood creep, as it did that very moment while there she stood. Also, by way of throwing further light on this clue of the tinder-box, a collection was made of all the articles purchased from the peddler at various houses, and carried to the rainbow to be exhibited there. In fact, there was a general feeling in the village that for the clearing up of this robbery there must be a great deal done at the rainbow, so that no man need offer his wife an excuse for going there, while it was the scene of severe public duties. Some disappointment was felt, and perhaps a little indignation also, when it became known that Silas Marner, on being questioned by the squire and the parson, had retained no other recollection of the peddler than that he had called at his door, but had not entered his house, having turned away at once when Silas, holding the door ajar, had said that he wanted nothing. This had been Silas's testimony, though he clutched strongly at the idea of the peddler's being the culprit, if only because it gave him a definite image of a whereabout for his gold, after it had been taken away from its hiding-place, he could see it now in the peddler's box. But it was observed with some irritation in the village that anybody but a blind creature like Marner would have seen the man prowling about, for how came he to leave his tinder-box in the ditch close by if he hadn't been lingering there? Doubtless he had made his observations when he saw Marner at the door. Anybody might know, and only look at him, that the weaver was a half-crazy miser. It was a wonder the peddler hadn't murdered him. Men of that sort, with rings in their ears, had been known for murderers often and often. There had been one tried at the sizes, not so long ago, but what there were people living who remembered it. Godfrey Cass, indeed, entering the rainbow during one of Mr. Snell's frequently repeated recitals of his testimony, had treated it lightly stating that he himself had bought a penknife of the peddler, and thought him a merry, grinning fellow enough. It was all nonsense, he said, about the man's evil looks. But this was spoken of in the village as the random talk of youth, as if it was only Mr. Snell who had seen something odd about the peddler. On the contrary, there were at least half a dozen who were ready to go before Justice Malam, and give in much more striking testimony than any the landlord could furnish. It was to be hoped Mr. Godfrey would not go to Tarley and throw cold water on what Mr. Snell said there, and so prevent the justice from drawing up a warrant. He was suspected of intending this when, after midday, he was seen setting off on horseback, in the direction of Tarley. But by this time Godfrey's interest in the robbery had faded before his growing anxiety about Dunstan and Wildfire, and he was going, not to Tarley, but to Batherley unable to rest in uncertainty about them any longer. The possibility that Dunstan had played him the ugly trick of riding away with Wildfire, to return at the end of a month, when he had gambled away or otherwise squandered the price of the horse, 
was a fear that urged itself upon him more, even, than the thought of an accidental injury, and now that the dance at Mrs. Osgood's was past, he was irritated with himself that he had trusted his horse to Dunstan. Instead of trying to steal his fears, he encouraged them, with that superstitious impression which clings to us all, that if we expect evil very strongly it is the less likely to come. And when he heard a horse approaching at a trot, and saw a hat rising above a hedge beyond an angle of the lane, he felt as if his conjuration had succeeded. But no sooner did the horse come within sight than his heart sank again. It was not Wildfire, and in a few moments more he discerned that the rider was not Dunstan, but Bryce, who pulled up to speak, with a face that implied something disagreeable. "'Well, Mr. Godfrey, that's a lucky brother of yours, that Master Dunsey, isn't he?' "'What do you mean?' said Godfrey, hastily. "'Why, hasn't he been home yet?' said Bryce. "'Home? No. What has happened? Be quick. What has he done with my horse?' "'Ah, I thought it was yours, though he pretended you had parted with it to him.' "'Has he thrown him down and broken his knees?' said Godfrey, flushed with exasperation. "'Worse than that,' said Bryce. You see, I'd made a bargain with him to buy the horse for a hundred and twenty, a swinging price, but I always liked the horse. And what does he do but go and stake him? Fly at a hedge with stakes in it, atop a bank with a ditch before it. The horse had been dead a pretty good while when he was found. So he hasn't been home since, has he? Home? No, said Godfrey, and he'd better keep away. Confound me for a fool. I might have known this would be the end of it. "'Well, to tell you the truth,' said Bryce, after I'd bargained for the horse, it did come into my head that he might be riding and selling the horse without your knowledge, for I didn't believe it was his own. I knew Master Dunsey was up to his tricks sometimes. But where could he be gone? He's never been seen at Batterley. He couldn't have been hurt, for he must have walked off.' "'Hurt?' said Godfrey, bitterly. "'He'll never be hurt. He's made to hurt other people.' "'And so you did give him leave to sell the horse, eh?' said Bryce. "'Yes, I wanted to part with the horse. He was always a little too hard in the mouth for me,' said Godfrey, his pride making him wince under the idea that Bryce guessed the sale to be a matter of necessity. I was going to see after him. I thought some mischief had happened. I'll go back now,' he added, turning the horse's head, and wishing he could get rid of Bryce, for he felt that the long-dreaded crisis in his life was close upon him. "'You're coming on to Ravelo, aren't you?' "'Well, no, not now,' said Bryce. "'I was coming round there, for I had to go to Flitton, "'and I thought I might as well take you in my way "'and just let you know all I knew myself about the horse. "'I suppose Master Dunsey didn't like to show himself "'till the ill news had blown over a bit. "'He's perhaps gone to pay a visit at the Three Crowns by Whitbridge. "'I know he's fond of the house.' "'Perhaps he is,' said Godfrey, rather absently. "'Then, rousing himself, he said, with an effort at carelessness, "'We shall hear of him soon enough. I'll be bound.' "'Well, here's my turning,' said Bryce, not surprised to perceive that Godfrey was rather down, "'so I'll bid you good day, and wish I may bring you better news another time.' Godfrey rode along slowly, representing to himself the scene of confession to his father, from which he felt that there was now no longer any escape. The revelation about the money must be made the very next morning, and if he withheld the rest— Dunstan would be sure to come back shortly, and, finding that he must bear the brunt of his father's anger, would tell the whole story out of spite, even though he had nothing to gain by it. There was one step, perhaps, by which he might still win Dunstan's silence, and put off the evil day. He might tell his father that he had himself spent the money paid to him by Fowler, and as he had never been guilty of such an offence before, the affair would blow over after a little storming. But Godfrey could not bend himself to this. He felt that in letting Dunstan have the money, he had already been guilty of a breach of trust hardly less culpable than that of spending the money directly for his own behoof, and yet there was a distinction between the two acts that made him feel that the one was so much more blackening than the other as to be intolerable to him. "'I don't pretend to be a good fellow,' he said to himself, "'but I'm not a scoundrel. At least I'll stop short somewhere.' I'll bear the consequences of what I have done sooner than make believe I've done what I never would have done. I'd never have spent the money for my own pleasure. I was tortured into it. Through the remainder of this day Godfrey, with only occasional fluctuations, 
kept his will bent in the direction of a complete avowal to his father, and he withheld the story of Wildfire's loss till the next morning, that it might serve him as an introduction to heavier matter. The old squire was accustomed to his son's frequent absence from home, and thought neither Dunstan's nor Wildfire's non-appearance a matter calling for remark. Godfrey said to himself again and again that if he let slip this one opportunity of confession, he might never have another. The revelation might be made even in a more odious way than by Dunstan's malignity. She might come, as she had threatened to do. And then he tried to make the scene easier to himself by rehearsal. He made up his mind how he would pass from the admission of his weakness in letting Dunstan have the money to the fact that Dunstan had a hold on him which he had been unable to shake off, and how he would work up his father to expect something very bad before he told him the fact. The old squire was an implacable man. He made resolutions in violent anger, and he was not to be moved from them after his anger had subsided, as fiery volcanic matters cool and harden into rock. Like many violent and implacable men, he allowed evils to grow under favour of his own heedlessness, till they pressed upon him with exasperating force, and then he turned round with fierce severity and became unrelentingly hard. This was his system with his tenants. He allowed them to get into arrears, neglect their fences, reduce their stock, sell their straw, and otherwise go the wrong way. And then, when he became short of money in consequence of this indulgence, he took the hardest measures and would listen to no appeal. Godfrey knew all this, and felt it with the greater force because he had constantly suffered annoyance from witnessing his father's sudden fits of unrelentingness, for which his own habitual irresolution deprived him of all sympathy. He was not critical on the faulty indulgence which preceded these fits. That seemed to him natural enough. Still, there was just the chance, Godfrey thought, that his father's pride might see this marriage in a light that would induce him to hush it up, rather than turn his son out and make the family the talk of the country for ten miles round. This was the view of the case that Godfrey managed to keep before him pretty closely till midnight, and he went to sleep thinking that he had done with inward debating. But when he awoke, in the still morning darkness, he found it impossible to reawaken his evening thoughts. It was as if they had been tired out, and were not to be roused to further work. Instead of arguments for confession, he could now feel the presence of nothing but its evil consequences. The old dread of disgrace came back, the old shrinking from the thought of raising a hopeless barrier between himself and Nancy, the old disposition to rely on chances which might be favourable to him and save him from betrayal. Why, after all, should he cut off the hope of them by his own act? He had seen the matter in a wrong light yesterday. He had been in a rage with Dunstan, and had thought of nothing but a thorough break-up of their mutual understanding, but what it would be really wisest for him to do was to try and soften his father's anger against Dunsey, and keep things as nearly as possible in their old condition. If Dunsey did not come back for a few days, and Godfrey did not know but that the rascal had enough money in his pocket to enable him to keep away still longer, everything might blow over. End of chapter 8「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. » Silas Marner, The Weaver of Ravelow, by George Eliot Chapter 9 Godfrey rose and took his own breakfast earlier than usual, but lingered in the wainscoted parlour till his younger brothers had finished their meal and gone out, awaiting his father, who always took a walk with his managing man before breakfast. Every one breakfasted at a different hour in the Red House, and the squire was always the latest, giving a long chance to a rather feeble morning appetite before he tried it. The table had been spread with substantial eatables nearly two hours before he presented himself, a tall, stout man of sixty, with a face in which the knit brow and rather hard glance seemed contradicted by the slack and feeble mouth. His person showed marks of habitual neglect, his dress was slovenly, 
and yet there was something in the presence of the old squire distinguishable from that of the ordinary farmers in the parish, who were perhaps every whit as refined as he, but having slouched their way through life with a consciousness of being in the vicinity of their betters, wanted that self-possession and authoritativeness of voice and carriage which belonged to a man who thought of superiors as remote existences with whom he had personally little more to do than with America or the stars. The squire had been used to parish homage all his life, used to the presupposition that his family, his tankards, and everything that was his, were the oldest and best, and as he never associated with any gentry higher than himself, his opinion was not disturbed by comparison. He glanced at his son as he entered the room, and said, "'What, sir, haven't you had your breakfast yet?' But there was no pleasant morning greeting between them not because of any unfriendliness, but because the sweet flower of courtesy is not a growth of such homes as the Red House. "'Yes, sir,' said Godfrey, "'I've had my breakfast, but I was waiting to speak to you.' "'Ah, well,' said the squire, throwing himself indifferently into his chair, and speaking in a ponderous, coughing fashion, which was felt in Ravelow to be a sort of privilege of his rank, while he cut a piece of beef, and held it up before the deer-hound that had come in with him. "'Ring the bell for my ale, will you? You youngsters' business is your own pleasure, mostly. There's no hurry about it for anybody but yourselves.' The squire's life was quite as idle as his son's, but it was a fiction kept up by himself and his contemporaries, in Ravelow, that youth was exclusively the period of folly, and that their aged wisdom was constantly in a state of endurance mitigated by sarcasm. Godfrey waited, before he spoke again, until the ale had been brought and the door closed, an interval during which Fleet, the deer-hound, had consumed enough bits of beef to make a poor man's holiday dinner. "'There's been a cursed piece of ill-luck with Wildfire,' he began, happened the day before yesterday. "'What? Broke his knees?' said the squire, after taking a draught of ale. "'I thought you knew how to ride better than that, sir. I never threw a horse down in my life. If I had, I might a whistled for another, for my father wasn't quite so ready to unstring as some other fathers I know of. But they must turn over a new leaf. They must. What with mortgages and arrears, I'm as short a cash as a roadside pauper. And that fool Kimball says the newspaper's talking about peace. Why, the country wouldn't have a leg to stand on. Prices had run down like a jack. And I should never get my arrears, not if I sold all the fellows up. And there's that damned Fowler. I won't put up with him any longer. I've told Winthrop to go to Cox this very day. The lying scoundrel told me he'd be sure to pay me a hundred last month. He takes advantage because he's on that outlying farm, and thinks I shall forget him." The squire had delivered this speech, in a coughing and interrupted manner, but with no pause long enough for Godfrey to make it a pretext for taking up the word again. He felt that his father meant to ward off any request for money on the ground of the misfortune with Wildfire, and that the emphasis he had thus been led to lay on his shortness of cash and his arrears was likely to produce an attitude of mind the utmost unfavourable for his own disclosure. But he must go on, now he had begun. "'It's worse than breaking the horse's knees. He's been staked and killed,' he said, as soon as his father was silent, and had begun to cut his meat. "'But I wasn't thinking of asking you to buy me another horse. I was only thinking I'd lost the means of paying you with the price of wildfire, as I'd meant to do. Dunsey took him to the hunt to sell him for me the other day, and after he'd made a bargain for a hundred and twenty with Bryce, he went after the hounds, and took some fool's leap or other that did for the horse at once. If it hadn't been for that, I should have paid you a hundred pounds this morning." The squire had laid down his knife and fork, and was staring at his son in amazement, not being sufficiently quick of brain to form a probable guess as to what could have caused so strange an inversion of the paternal and filial relations as this proposition of his son to pay him a hundred pounds. "'The truth is, I'm very sorry. I was quite to blame,' said Godfrey. Fowler did pay that hundred pounds. He paid it to me, when I was over there one day last month, and Dunsey bothered me for the money, and I let him have it, because I hoped I should be able to pay it you before this." The squire was purple with anger before his son had done speaking, and found utterance difficult. "'You let Dunsey have it, sir. And how long have you been so thick with Dunsey that you must collogue with him to embezzle my money? Are you turning out a scamp? I tell you I won't have it. 
I'll turn the whole pack of you out of the house together and marry again. I'll have you to remember, sir, my property's got no entail on it. Since my grandfather's time, the Casses can do as they like with their land. Remember that, sir. Let Dunsey have the money. Why should you let Dunsey have the money? There's some lie at the bottom of it. There's no lie, sir, said Godfrey. I wouldn't have spent the money myself, but Dunsey bothered me, and I was a fool, and let him have it. But I meant to pay it, whether he did or not. That's the whole story. I never meant to embezzle money, and I'm not the man to do it. You never knew me to do a dishonest trick, sir. Where's Dunsey, then? What ye stand talking there for? Go and fetch Dunsey, as I tell you, and let him give account of what he wanted the money for, and what he's done with it. He shall repent it. I'll turn him out. I said I would, and I'll do it. He shan't brave me. Go and fetch him. Dunsey isn't come back, sir. What? Did he break his own neck, then? said the squire, with some disgust at the idea that, in that case, he could not fulfil his threat. No, he wasn't hurt, I believe, for the horse was found dead, and Dunsey must have walked off. I dare say we shall see him again, by and by. I don't know where he is. And what must you be letting him have my money for? Answer me that, said the squire, attacking Godfrey again, since Dunsey was not within reach. Well, sir, I don't know, said Godfrey, hesitatingly. That was a feeble evasion, but Godfrey was not fond of lying, and not being sufficiently aware that no sort of duplicity can long flourish without the help of vocal falsehoods, he was quite unprepared with invented motives. "'You don't know? I'll tell you what it is, sir. You've been up to some trick, and you've been bribing him not to tell,' said the squire, with a sudden acuteness which startled Godfrey, who felt his heart beat violently at the nearness of his father's guess. The sudden alarm pushed him on to take the next step. A very slight impulse suffices for that on a downward road. "'Well, sir,' he said, trying to speak with a careless ease, "'it was a little affair between me and Dunsey. It's no matter to anybody else. It's hardly worth while to pry into young men's fooleries. It wouldn't have made any difference to you, sir, if I'd not had the bad luck to lose Wildfire. I should have paid you the money.' "'Fooleries! Shaw!' "'It's time you were done with fooleries, and I'd have you know, sir, you must have done with them," said the squire, frowning and casting an angry glance at his son. "'Your goings-on are not what I shall find money for any longer. There's my grandfather had his stables full of horses, and kept a good house, too, and in worse times by what I can make out, and so might I if I hadn't four good-for-nothing fellows to hang on me like horse-leeches. I've been too good a father to you all, that's what it is. But I shall pull up, sir.' Godfrey was silent. He was not likely to be very penetrating in his judgments, but he had always had a sense that his father's indulgence had not been kindness, and had had a vague longing for some discipline that would have checked his own errant weakness and helped his better will. The squire ate his bread and meat hastily, took a deep draught of ale, then turned his chair from the table, and began to speak again. "'It'll be all the worse for you, you know. You'd need try and help me keep things together.' "'Well, sir,' I've often offered to take the management of things, but you know you've taken it so ill always, and seemed to think I wanted to push you out of your place. I know nothing of your offering or my taking it ill, said the squire, whose memory consisted in certain strong impressions unmodified by detail. But I know one while you seem to be thinking of Marian, and I didn't offer to put any obstacles in your way, as some fathers would. I'd as leave you married Lamater's daughter as anybody. I suppose, if I'd said you nay, you'd a kept on with it, but for one to contradiction you've changed your mind. You're a shilly-shally fellow. You take after your poor mother. She never had a will of her own. A woman has no call for one, if she's got a proper man for her husband. But your wife had need have one, for you hardly know your own mind enough to make both your legs walk one way. The lass hasn't said downright she won't have you, has she?' "'No,' said Godfrey, feeling very hot and uncomfortable. "'But I don't think she will.' think. Why haven't you the courage to ask her? Do you stick to it? Do you want to have her? That's the thing. There's no other woman I want to marry, said Godfrey, evasively. Well, then, let me make the offer for you, that's all, if you haven't the pluck to do it yourself. Lamenter isn't likely to be loath for his daughter to marry into my family, I should think. And as for the pretty lass, she wouldn't have her cousin, and there's nobody else, as I see, could have stood in your way." "'I'd rather let it be, please, sir, at present,' said Godfrey, in alarm. "'I think she's a little offended with me just now. 
and I should like to speak for myself. A man must manage these things for himself. Well, speak, then, and manage it, and see if you can't turn over a new leaf. That's what a man must do when he thinks a Marian. I don't see how I can think about it at present, sir. You wouldn't like to settle me on one of the farms, I suppose, and I don't think she'd come to live in this house with all my brothers. It's a different sort of life to what she's been used to. Not come live in this house? Don't tell me. You ask her, that's all, said the squire, with a short, scornful laugh. I'd rather let the thing be at present, sir, said Godfrey. I hope you won't try to hurry it on by saying anything. "'I shall do what I choose,' said the squire, "'and I shall let you know I'm master, "'else you may turn out and find an estate to drop into somewhere else. "'Go out and tell Winthrop not to go to Cox's, but wait for me, "'and tell him to get my horse saddled. "'And stop, look out and get that hack of Dunsey sold "'and hand me the money, will you? "'He'll keep no more hacks at my expense, "'and if you know where he's sneaking, I dare say you do, "'you may tell him to spare himself the journey of coming back home. "'Let him turn ostler and keep himself.' He shan't hang on me any more. I don't know where he is, sir, and if I did, it isn't my place to tell him to keep away, said Godfrey, moving toward the door. Confound it, sir, don't stay arguing, but go and order my horse, said the squire, taking up a pipe. Godfrey left the room, hardly knowing whether he were more relieved by the sense that the interview was ended without having made any change in his position, or more uneasy that he had entangled himself still further in prevarication and deceit. What had passed about his proposing to Nancy had raised a new alarm, lest by some after-dinner words of his father's to Mr. Lameter he should be thrown into the embarrassment of being obliged absolutely to decline her when she seemed to be within his reach. He fled to his usual refuge, that of hoping for some unforeseen turn of fortune, some favourable chance which would save him from unpleasant consequences, perhaps even justify his insincerity by manifesting its prudence and in this point of trusting to some throw of fortune's dice, Godfrey can hardly be called specially old-fashioned. Favourable chance, I fancy, is the god of all men who follow their own devices, instead of obeying a law they believe in. Let even a polished man of these days get into a position he is ashamed to avow, and his mind will be bent on all the possible issues that may deliver him from the calculable results of that position." Let him live outside his income, or shirk the resolute, honest work that brings wages, and he will presently find himself dreaming of a possible benefactor, a possible simpleton who may be cajoled into using his interest, a possible state of mind in some possible person, not yet forthcoming. Let him neglect the responsibilities of his office, and he will inevitably anchor himself on the chance that the thing left undone may turn out not to be of the supposed importance." Let him betray his friend's confidence, and he will adore that same cunning complexity called chance, which gives him the hope that his friend will never know. Let him forsake a decent craft that he may pursue the gentilities of a profession to which nature never called him, and his religion will infallibly be the worship of blessed chance, which he will believe in as the mighty creator of success. The evil principle deprecated in that religion is the orderly sequence by which the seed brings forth a crop after its kind. End of chapter 9 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Silas Marner, The Weaver of Ravelo By George Eliot Chapter 10 Justice Malam was naturally regarded in Tarley and Ravelo as a man of capacious mind, seeing that he could draw much wider conclusions without evidence than could be expected of his neighbours who were not on the commission of the peace. Such a man was not likely to neglect the clue of the tinder-box, and an inquiry was set on foot concerning a peddler, name unknown, with curly black hair and a foreign complexion, carrying a box of cutlery and jewellery, and wearing large rings in his ears. But either because inquiry was too slow-footed to overtake him, 
or because the description applied to so many peddlers that inquiry did not know how to choose among them, weeks passed away, and there was no other result concerning the robbery than a gradual cessation of the excitement it had caused in Ravelo. Dunstan Cass's absence was hardly a subject of remark. He had once before had a quarrel with his father, and had gone off, nobody knew whither, to return at the end of six weeks, take up his old quarters unforbidden, and swagger as usual. His own family, who equally expected this issue, with the sole difference that the squire was determined this time to forbid him the old quarters, never mentioned his absence, and when his uncle Kimball or Mr. Osgood noticed it, the story of his having killed Wildfire, and committed some offence against his father, was enough to prevent surprise. To connect the fact of Dunsey's disappearance with that of the robbery occurring on the same day lay quite away from the track of every one's thought even Godfrey's, who had better reason than any one else to know what his brother was capable of. He remembered no mention of the weaver between them since the time, twelve years ago, when it was their boyish sport to deride him, and besides, his imagination constantly created an alibi for Dunstan. He saw him continually in some congenial haunt, to which he had walked off on leaving Wildfire, saw him sponging on chance acquaintances, and meditating a return home to the old amusement of tormenting his elder brother. Even if any brain in Ravelo had put the said two facts together, I doubt whether a combination so injurious to the prescriptive respectability of a family with a mural monument and venerable tankards would not have been suppressed as of unsound tendency. But Christmas puddings, brawn, and abundance of spirituous liquors, throwing the mental originality into the channel of nightmare, are great preservatives against a dangerous spontaneity of waking thought. When the robbery was talked of at the Rainbow and elsewhere, in good company, the balance continued to waver between the rational explanation founded on the tinder-box and the theory of an impenetrable mystery that mocked investigation. The advocates of the tinder-box and peddler view considered the other side a muddle-headed and credulous set, who, because they themselves were wall-eyed, supposed everybody else to have the same blank outlook, and the adherents of the inexplicable more than hinted that their antagonists were animals inclined to crow before they had found any corn, mere skimming-dishes in point of depth, whose clear-sightedness consisted in supposing there was nothing behind a barn-door because they couldn't see through it, so that, Though their controversy did not serve to elicit the fact concerning the robbery, it elicited some true opinions of collateral importance. But, while poor Silas's loss served thus to brush the slow current of Ravelo conversation, Silas himself was feeling the withering desolation of that bereavement about which his neighbours were arguing at their ease. To any one who had observed him before he lost his gold, it might have seemed that so withered and shrunken a life as his could hardly be susceptible of a bruise, could hardly endure any subtraction but such as would put an end to it altogether but in reality it had been an eager life filled with immediate purpose which fenced him in from the wide cheerless unknown it had been a clinging life and though the object round which its fibres had clung was a dead disrupted thing it satisfied the need for clinging but now the fence was broken down, the support was snatched away. Marner's thoughts could no longer move in their old round, and were baffled by a blank like that which meets a plodding ant when the earth has broken away on its homeward path. The loom was there, and the weaving, and the growing pattern in the cloth, but the bright treasure in the hole under his feet was gone. The prospect of handling and counting it was gone. The evening had no phantasm of delight to still the poor soul's craving. The thought of the money he would get by his actual work could bring no joy, for its meagre image was only a fresh reminder of his loss, and hope was too heavily crushed by the sudden blow for his imagination to dwell on the growth of a new hoard from that small beginning. He filled up the blank with grief. As he sat weaving, he every now and then moaned low, like one in pain. It was the sign that his thoughts had come round again to the sudden chasm, to the empty evening time and all the evening as he sat in his loneliness by his dull fire, he leaned his elbows on his knees, and clasped his head with his hands, and moaned very low, not as one who seeks to be heard. And yet he was not utterly forsaken in his trouble. 
the repulsion marner had always created in his neighbours was partly dissipated by the new light in which this misfortune had shown him instead of a man who had more cunning than honest folks could come by and what was worse had not the inclination to use that cunning in a neighbourly way it was now apparent that silas had not cunning enough to keep his own he was generally spoken of as a poor mushed creature and that avoidance of his neighbours which had before been referred to his ill-will and to a probable addiction to worse company was now considered mere craziness this change to a kindlier feeling was shown in various ways the odour of christmas cooking being on the wind it was the season when superfluous pork and black puddings are suggestive of charity in well-to-do families and silas's misfortune had brought him uppermost in the memory of housekeepers like mrs osgood mr crackenthorpe too while he admonished silas that his money had probably been taken from him because he thought too much of it and never came to church enforced the doctrine by a present of pig's potatoes well calculated to dissipate unfounded prejudices against the clerical character neighbours who had nothing but verbal consolation to give showed a disposition not only to greet silas and discuss his misfortune at some length when they encountered him in the village but also to take the trouble of calling at his cottage and getting him to repeat all the details on the very spot and then they would try to cheer him by saying well master marner you're no worse off nor other poor folks after all and if you was to be crippled the parish should give you allowance i suppose one reason why we are seldom able to comfort our neighbours with our words is that our good-will gets adulterated in spite of ourselves before it can pass our lips we can send black puddings and potatoes without giving them a flavour of our own egoism but language is a stream that is almost sure to smack of a mingled soil there was a fair proportion of kindness in ravelo but it was often of a beery and bungling sort, and took the shape least allied to the complimentary and hypocritical. Mr. Macy, for example, coming one evening expressly to let Silas know that recent events had given him the advantage of standing more favourably in the opinion of a man whose judgment was not formed lightly, opened the conversation by saying, as soon as he had seated himself and adjusted his thumbs, "'Come, Master Marner, why, you've no call to sit a-moaning. You're a deal better off to a lost your money, nor to a kept it by by foul means. I used to think, when you first come into these parts, as you were no better nor you should be, you were younger a deal than what you are now. But you were always a staring, white-faced creature, partly like a bald-faced calf, as I may say. But there's no knowing. It isn't every queer looks thing as old Harry's had the making of.' i mean speaking o toads and such for they're often harmless like and useful against varmin and it's pretty much the same with you as fur as i can see though as to the yarbs and stuff to cure the breathing if you brought that sort o' knowledge from distant parts you might a been a bit freer of it and if the knowledge wasn't well come by well you might a made up for it by coming to church regular for as the children as the wise woman charmed i've been at the christening of em again and again and they took the water just as well and that's reasonable, for if old Harry's got a mind to do a bit of kindness for a holiday, like, who's got anything against it? That's my thinking, and I've been clerk o' this parish forty year, and I know when the parson and me does the cussing of an ash Wednesday, there's no cussing of folks as have a mind to be cured without a doctor, let Kimball say what he will. And so, Master Marner, as I was saying, for there's windings o' things as they may carry you to the fur end o' the prayer-book afore you get back to em my advice is as you keep up your sperrits for as for thinking you're a deep un and ha' got more inside you nor'll bear daylight i'm not o that opinion at all and so i tell the neighbours for says i you talk o master marner making out a tale why it's nonsense that is it'd take a cute man to make a tale like that and says i he looked as scared as a rabbit during this discursive address, Silas had continued motionless in his previous attitude, leaning his elbows on his knees, and pressing his hands against his head. Mr. Macy, not doubting that he had been listened to, paused in the expectation of some appreciatory reply, but Marner remained silent. He had a sense that the old man meant to be good-natured and neighbourly, but the kindness fell on him as sunshine falls on the wretched. He had no heart to taste it, and felt that it was very far off him. "'Come, Master Marner, have you got nothing to say to that?' said Mr. Macy at last, with a slight accent of impatience. "'Oh,' 
said Marner, slowly, shaking his head between his hands. I thank you. Thank you. Kindly. Ay, ay, to be sure, I thought you would, said Mr. Macy, and my advice is, have you got a Sunday suit? No, said Marner. I doubted it was so, said Mr. Macy. Now, let me advise you to get a Sunday suit. There's Tookey. He's a poor creature, but he's got my tailoring business, and some of my money in it, and he shall make a suit at a low price, and give you trust, and then you can come to church, and be a bit neighborly. Why, you've never heard me say amen since you come into these parts, and I recommend you to lose no time, for it'll be poor work when Tookey has it all to himself, for I mayn't be equal to stand at the desk at all come another winter. Here Mr. Macy paused, perhaps expecting some sign of emotion in his hearer, but not observing any, he went on. And as for the money for the suit to close, why, you get a matter of a pound a week at your weaving, Master Marner, and you're a young man, eh, for all you look so mushed. Why, you couldn't have been five and twenty when you come into these parts, eh? Silas started a little at the change to a questioning tone, and answered mildly, I don't know. I can't rightly say. It's a long while since. After receiving such an answer as this, it is not surprising that Mr. Macy observed, later on in the evening at the Rainbow, that Marner's head was all of a muddle, and that it was to be doubted if he ever knew when Sunday came round, which showed him a worse heathen than many a dog. Another of Silas's comforters, besides Mr. Macy, came to him with a mind highly charged on the same topic. This was Mrs. Winthrop, the wheelwright's wife. The inhabitants of Ravelow were not severely regular in their church-going, and perhaps there was hardly a person in the parish who could not have held that to go to church every Sunday in the calendar would have shown a greedy desire to stand well with heaven, and get an undue advantage over their neighbours, a wish to be better than the common run, that would have implied a reflection on those who had had godfathers and godmothers as well as themselves, and had an equal right to the burying service. At the same time, it was understood to be requisite for all who were not household servants, or young men, to take the sacrament at one of the great festivals. Squire Cass himself took it on Christmas Day, while those who were held to be good livers went to church with greater, though still with moderate frequency. Mrs. Winthrop was one of these. She was in all respects a woman of scrupulous conscience, so eager for duties that life seemed to offer them too scantily unless she rose at half-past four, though this threw a scarcity of work over the more advanced hours of the morning, which it was a constant problem with her to remove. Yet she had not the vixenish temper which is sometimes supposed to be a necessary condition of such habits. She was a very mild, patient woman, whose nature it was to seek out all the sadder and more serious elements of life, and pasture her mind upon them. She was the person always first thought of in Ravelo when there was illness or death in a family, when leeches were to be applied, or there was a sudden disappointment in a monthly nurse. She was a comfortable woman, good-looking, fresh-complexioned, having her lips always slightly screwed, as if she felt herself in a sick-room with the doctor or the clergyman present. But she was never whimpering. No one had seen her shed tears. She was simply grave, and inclined to shake her head and sigh, almost imperceptibly, like a funereal mourner who is not a relation. It seemed surprising that Ben Winthrop, who loved his quart-pot and his joke, got along so well with Dolly, but she took her husband's jokes and joviality as patiently as everything else, considering that men would be so— and viewing the stronger sex in the light of animals whom it had pleased heaven to make naturally troublesome like bulls and turkey-cocks. This good wholesome woman could hardly fail to have her mind drawn strongly towards Silas Marner, now that he appeared in the light of a sufferer, and one Sunday afternoon she took her little boy Aaron with her, and went to call on Silas, carrying in her hand some small lard-cakes, flat paste-like articles much esteemed in Ravelo. Aaron, an apple-cheeked youngster of seven, with a clean starched frill which looked like a plate for the apples, needed all his adventurous curiosity to embolden him against the possibility that the big-eyed weaver might do him some bodily injury, and his dubiety was much increased when, on arriving at the stone-pits, they heard the mysterious sound of the loom. "'Ah, it is as I thought,' 
said Mrs. Winthrop, sadly. They had to knock loudly before Silas heard them, but when he did come to the door he showed no impatience, as he would once have done, at a visit that had been unasked for and unexpected. Formerly his heart had been as a locked casket with its treasure inside, but now the casket was empty, and the lock was broken. Left groping in darkness with his prop utterly gone, Silas had inevitably a sense, though a dull and half-despairing one, that if any help came to him it must come from without and there was a slight stirring of expectation at the sight of his fellow-men, a faint consciousness of dependence on their good will. He opened the door wide to admit Dolly, but without otherwise returning her greeting than by moving the armchair a few inches as a sign that she was to sit down in it. Dolly, as soon as she was seated, removed the white cloth that covered her lard cakes, and said in her gravest way, "'I'd a baking yesterday, Master Marner, and the lard cakes turned out better nor common, and I'd a asked you to accept some, if you'd thought well. I don't eat such things myself, for a bit of bread's what I like from one year's end to the other, but men's stomachs are made so comical, they want a change. They do, I know, God help em. Dolly sighed gently as she held out the cakes to Silas, who thanked her kindly, and looked very close at them, absently, being accustomed to look so at everything he took into his hand, eyed all the while by the wondering bright orbs of the small Aaron, who had made an outwork of his mother's chair, and was peeping round from behind it. "'There's letters pricked on em, said Dolly. "'I can't read em myself, and there's nobody, not Mr. Macy himself, rightly knows what they mean, but they've a good meaning, for they're the same as is on the pulpit-cloth at church. What are they, Aaron, my dear?' Aaron retreated completely behind his outwork. "'Oh, go, that's naughty,' said his mother, mildly. "'Well, whatever the letters are, they've a good meaning, and it's a stamp as has been in our house, Ben says, ever since he was a little un, and his mother used to put it on the cakes, and I've all has put it on, too, for if there's any good, we've need of it in this world.' "'It's I.H.S.,' said Silas, at which proof of learning Aaron peeped round the chair again. "'Well, to be sure, you can read em off,' said Dolly. "'Ben's read em to me the many and many a time, but they slip out of my mind again, the more's the pity, for they're good letters, else they wouldn't be in the church. And so I prick em on all the loaves and all the cakes, though sometimes they won't hold because of the rising. For, as I said, if there's any good to be got, we've need of it in this world, that we have. And I hope they'll bring good to you, Master Marner, for it's with that will I brought you the cakes.' and you see the letters have held better nor common. Silas was as unable to interpret the letters as Dolly, but there was no possibility of misunderstanding the desire to give comfort that made itself heard in her quiet tones. He said, with more feeling than before, "'Thank you. Thank you kindly.' But he laid down the cakes and seated himself absently, drearily unconscious of any distinct benefit towards which the cakes and the letters, or even Dolly's kindness, could tend for him. "'Ah, oh, if there's good anywhere, we've need of it,' repeated Dolly, who did not lightly forsake a serviceable phrase. She looked at Silas pityingly as she went on. "'But you didn't hear the church bells this morning, Master Marner. I doubt you didn't know it was Sunday. Living so lone here, you lose your count, I dare say. And then, when your loom makes a noise, you can't hear the bells. More particular now the frost kills the sound.' "'Yes, I did.' "'I heard em said Silas, to whom Sunday bells were a mere accident of the day, and not part of its sacredness. There had been no bells in Lantern Yard. "'Dear heart,' said Dolly, pausing before she spoke again, "'but what a pity it is you should work of a Sunday, and not clean yourself, if you didn't go to church, for if you'd a roasting bit, it might be as you couldn't leave it, being a lone man. But there's the bakehouse.' if you could make up your mind to spend a twopence on the oven now and then. Not every week, of course. I shouldn't like to do that myself. You might carry your bit of dinner there, for it's nothing but right to have a bit of summit hot of a Sunday, and not to make it as you can't know your dinner from Saturday. But now, upon Christmas Day, this blessed Christmas as is ever coming, if you was to take your dinner to the bakehouse, and go to church, and see the holly and the yew, and hear the anthem, and then take the sacrament, you'd be a deal the better, and you'd know which end you stood on, and you could put your trust in them as knows better nor we do, seein' you'd a done what it lies on us all to do. 
Dolly's exhortation, which was an unusually long effort of speech for her, was uttered in the soothing persuasive tone with which she would have tried to prevail on a sick man to take his medicine, or a basin of gruel for which he had no appetite. Silas had never before been closely urged on the point of his absence from church, which had only been thought of as part of his general queerness, and he was too direct and simple to evade Dolly's appeal. "'Nay, nay,' he said, "'I know nothing at church. I've never been to church.' "'No,' said Dolly, in a low tone of wonderment. Then, bethinking herself of Silas's advent from an unknown country, she said, "'Could it have been as they'd no church where you was born?' "'Oh, yes,' said Silas, meditatively, sitting in his usual posture of leaning on his knees and supporting his head. "'There was churches. A many. It was a big town. But I knew nothing of em. I went to chapel.' Dolly was much puzzled at this new word, but she was rather afraid of inquiring further, lest chapel might mean some haunt of wickedness. After a little thought, she said, "'Well, Master Marner, it's never too late to turn over a new leaf, and if you've never had no church, there's no telling the good it'll do you, for I feel so set up and comfortable as never was when I've been and heard the prayers, and the singing to the praise and glory of God as Mr. Macy gives out, and Mr. Crackenthorpe saying good words, and more particular on sacrament day, and if a bit of trouble comes, I feel as I can put up with it, for I've looked for help in the right quarter, and give myself up to them as we must all give ourselves up to at the last, and if we'n done our part, it isn't to be believed as them as are above us'll be worse nor we are, and come short of theirn. Poor Dolly's exposition of her simple Ravelo theology fell rather unmeaningly on Silas's ears, for there is no word in it that could rouse a memory of what he had known as religion, and his comprehension was quite baffled by the plural pronoun, which was no heresy of Dolly's, but only her way of avoiding a presumptuous familiarity. He remained silent, not feeling inclined to assent to the part of Dolly's speech which he fully understood, her recommendation that he should go to church. Indeed, Silas was so unaccustomed to talk beyond the brief questions and answers necessary for the transaction of his simple business, that words did not easily come to him without the urgency of a distinct purpose. But now, little Aaron, having become used to the weaver's awful presence, had advanced to his mother's side, and Silas, seeming to notice him for the first time, tried to return Dolly's signs of good will by offering the lad a bit of lard cake. Aaron shrank back a little, and rubbed his head against his mother's shoulder, but still thought the piece of cake worth the risk of putting his hand out for it. "'Oh, for shame, Aaron,' said his mother, taking him on her lap, however. "'Why, you don't want cake again yet a while. He's wonderful hearty,' she went on, with a little sigh. "'That he is, God knows.' He's my youngest, and we spoil him sadly, for either me or the father must always have him in our sight, that we must. She stroked Aaron's brown head, and thought it must do Master Marner good to see such a picture of a child. But Marner, on the other side of the hearth, saw the neat-featured rosy face as a mere dim round, with two dark spots in it. "'And he's got a voice like a bird, you wouldn't think,' Dolly went on. He can sing a Christmas carol as his father's taught him, and I take it for a token he'll come to good, as he can learn the good tunes so quick. Come, Aaron, stand up and sing the carol to Master Marner. Come. Aaron replied by rubbing his forehead against his mother's shoulder. Oh, that's naughty, said Dolly gently. Stand up, when mother tells you, and let me hold the cake till you've done. Aaron was not indisposed to display his talents, even to an ogre, under protecting circumstances, and after a few more signs of coyness, consisting chiefly in rubbing the backs of his hands over his eyes, and then peeping between them at Master Marner to see if he looked anxious for the carol, he at length allowed his head to be duly adjusted, and standing behind the table, which let him appear above it only as far as his broad frill, so that he looked like a cherubic head untroubled with a body, he began with a clear chirp, and in a melody that had the rhythm of an industrious hammer. God rest you, merry gentlemen, let nothing you dismay, for Jesus Christ our Saviour was born on Christmas Day. Dolly listened with a devout look 
glancing at Marner in some confidence that this strain would help to allure him to church. "'That's Christmas music,' she said, when Aaron had ended, and had secured his piece of cake again. "'There's no other music equal to the Christmas music. Ark the herald angels sing, and you may judge what it is at church, Master Marner, with the bassoon and voices, as you can't help thinking you've got to a better place already, for I wouldn't speak ill of this world, seeing as them put us in it as knows best, but what with the drink, and the quarrelling, and the bad illnesses, and the hard dying, as I've seen times and times, once thankful to hear of a better. The boy sings pretty, don't he, Master Marner? Yes said Silas, absently. Very pretty. The Christmas carol, with its hammer-like rhythm, had fallen on his ears as strange music, quite unlike a hymn, and could have none of the effect Dolly contemplated. But he wanted to show her that he was grateful, and the only mode that occurred to him was to offer Aaron a bit more cake. "'Oh, no, thank you, Master Marner,' said Dolly, holding down Aaron's willing hands. "'We must be going home now, and so I wish you good-bye, Master Marner, and if you ever feel any ways bad in your inside, as you can't fend for yourself, I'll come and clean up for you, and get you a bit of victual and willing. But I beg and pray of you to leave off weaving of a Sunday, for it's bad for soul and body, and the money as comes o' that way'll be a bad bed to lie down on at the last, if it doesn't fly away nobody knows where, like the white frost. And you'll excuse me being that free with you, Master Marner, for I wish you well. I do. Make your bow, Aaron. Silas said, Good-bye, and thank you kindly as he opened the door for Dolly, but he couldn't help feeling relieved when she was gone, relieved that he might weave again and moan at his ease. Her simple view of life and its comforts, by which she had tried to cheer him, was only like a report of unknown objects which his imagination could not fashion. The fountains of human love and of faith in a divine love had not yet been unlocked, and his soul was still the shrunken rivulet with only this difference, that its little groove of sand was blocked up, and it wandered confusedly against dark obstruction. And so, notwithstanding the honest persuasions of Mr. Macy and Dolly Winthrop, Silas spent his Christmas day in loneliness, eating his meat in sadness of heart, though the meat had come to him as a neighborly present. In the morning he looked out on the black frost that seemed to press cruelly on every blade of grass, while the half-icy red pool shivered under the bitter wind, but towards evening the snow began to fall, and curtained from him even that dreary outlook, shutting him close up with his narrow grief. And he sat in his robbed home through the livelong evening, not caring to close his shutters or lock his door, pressing his head between his hands and moaning, till the cold grasped him and told him that his fire was grey. Nobody in this world but himself knew that he was the same Silas Marner who had once loved his fellow with tender love, and trusted in an unseen goodness. Even to himself that past experience had become dim. But in Ravelo village the bells rang merrily, and the church was fuller than all through the rest of the year, with red faces among the abundant dark green boughs, faces prepared for a longer service than usual by an odorous breakfast of toast and ale. Those green boughs, the hymn and anthem never heard but at Christmas, even the Athanasian Creed, which was discriminated from the others only as being longer and of exceptional virtue, since it was only read on rare occasions, brought a vague exulting sense, for which the grown men could as little have found words as the children, that something great and mysterious had been done for them in heaven above and in earth below, which they were appropriating by their presence. And then the red faces made their way through the black biting frost to their own homes, feeling themselves free for the rest of the day to eat, drink, and be merry, and using that Christian freedom without diffidence. At Squire Cass's family party that day nobody mentioned Dunstan. Nobody was sorry for his absence, or feared it would be too long. The doctor and his wife, uncle and aunt Kimball, were there, and the annual Christmas talk was carried through without any omissions, rising to the climax of Mr. Kimball's experience when he walked the London hospitals thirty years back, together with striking professional anecdotes then gathered. 
whereupon cards followed, with Aunt Kimball's annual failure to follow suit, and Uncle Kimball's irascibility concerning the odd trick which was rarely explicable to him, when it was not on his side, without a general visitation of tricks to see that they were formed on sound principles, the whole being accompanied by a strong steaming odour of spirits and water. But the party on Christmas Day, being a strictly family party, was not the pre-eminently brilliant celebration of the season at the Red House. It was the great dance on New Year's Eve that made the glory of Squire Cass's hospitality, as of his forefathers, time out of mind. This was the occasion when all the society of Ravelow and Tarley, whether old acquaintances separated by long rutty distances, or cooled acquaintances, separated by misunderstandings concerning runaway calves, or acquaintances founded on intermittent condescension, counted on meeting, and on comporting themselves with mutual appropriateness. This was the occasion on which fair dames who came on pillions sent their bandboxes before them, supplied with more than their evening costume, for the feast was not to end with a single evening, like a paltry town entertainment, where the whole supply of eatables is put on the table at once, and bedding is scanty. The red house was provisioned as if for a siege, and as for the spare feather-beds ready to be laid on floors, they were as plentiful as might naturally be expected in a family that had killed its own geese for many generations. Godfrey Cass was looking forward to this New Year's Eve with a foolish, reckless longing that made him half deaf to his importunate companion, Anxiety. "'Duncy will be coming home soon. There will be a great blow-up. And how will you bribe his spite to silence?' said Anxiety. "'Oh, he won't come home before New Year's Eve, perhaps,' said Godfrey. "'And I shall sit by Nancy, then, and dance with her, and get a kind look from her in spite of herself.' "'But money is wanted in another quarter,' said Anxiety, in a louder voice. "'And how will you get it, without selling your mother's diamond pin? "'And if you don't get it—' "'Well, but something may happen to make things easier. "'At any rate, there's one pleasure for me close at hand. "'Nancy is coming.' "'Yes, and suppose your father should bring matters to a pass "'that will oblige you to decline marrying her, and to give your reasons. "'Hold your tongue, and don't worry me.' I can see Nancy's eyes, just as they will look at me, and feel her hand in mine already. But anxiety went on, though in noisy Christmas company, refusing to be utterly quieted even by much drinking. End of chapter 10「All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. » Silas Marner, The Weaver of Ravelow by George Eliot Chapter 11 Some women, I grant, would not appear to advantage seated on a pillion, and attired in a drab Joseph and a drab beaver bonnet, with a crown resembling a small stew-pan, for a garment suggesting a coachman's greatcoat, cut out under an exiguity of cloth that would only allow of miniature capes, is not well adapted to conceal deficiencies of contour, nor is drab a colour that will throw sallow cheeks into lively contrast. It was all the greater triumph to Miss Nancy Lammeter's beauty that she looked thoroughly bewitching in that costume, as, seated on the pillion behind her tall, erect father, she held one arm round him and looked down, with open-eyed anxiety, at the treacherous, snow-covered pools and puddles which sent up formidable splashings of mud under the stamp of Dobbin's foot. A painter would, perhaps, have preferred her in those moments when she was free from self-consciousness, but certainly the bloom on her cheeks was at its highest point of contrast with the surrounding drab when she arrived at the door of the red house, and saw Mr. Godfrey Cass ready to lift her from the pillion. She wished her sister Priscilla had come up at the same time behind the servant, for then she would have contrived that Mr. Godfrey should have lifted off Priscilla first, and, in the meantime, she would have persuaded her father to go round to the horse-block instead of alighting at the doorsteps. It was very painful, when you had made it quite clear to a young man that you were determined not to marry him, however much he might wish it, that he would still continue to pay you marked attentions. Besides, why didn't he always show the same attentions, if he meant them sincerely, 
instead of being so strange as Mr. Godfrey Cass was, sometimes behaving as if he didn't want to speak to her, and taking no notice of her for weeks and weeks, and then, all on a sudden, almost making love again. Moreover, it was quite plain he had no real love for her, else he would not let people have that to say of him which they did say. Did he suppose that Miss Nancy Lammeter was to be won by any man, squire or no squire, who led a bad life? That was not what she had been used to see in her own father, who was the soberest and best man in that countryside, only a little hot and hasty now and then, if things were not done to the minute. All these thoughts rushed through Miss Nancy's mind, in their habitual succession, in the moments between her first sight of Mr. Godfrey Cass, standing at the door, and her own arrival there. Happily, the squire came out too, and gave a loud greeting to her father, so that somehow, under cover of this noise, she seemed to find concealment for her confusion and neglect of any suitably formal behaviour, while she was being lifted from the pillion by strong arms which seemed to find her ridiculously small and light. And there was the best reason for hastening into the house at once, since the snow was beginning to fall again, threatening an unpleasant journey for such guests as were still on the road. These were a small minority, for already the afternoon was beginning to decline, and there would not be too much time for the ladies who came from a distance to attire themselves in readiness for the early tea which was to inspirit them for the dance. There was a buzz of voices through the house, as Miss Nancy entered, mingled with the scrape of a fiddle preluding in the kitchen, but the Lammeters were guests whose arrival had evidently been thought of so much that it had been watched for from the windows, for Mrs. Kimball, who did the honours at the Red House on these great occasions, came forward to meet Miss Nancy in the hall, and conduct her upstairs. Mrs. Kimball was the squire's sister, as well as the doctor's wife, a double dignity with which her diameter was in direct proportion, so that, a journey upstairs being rather fatiguing to her, she did not oppose Miss Nancy's request to be allowed to find her way alone to the blue room, where the Miss Lammeter's bandboxes had been deposited on their arrival in the morning. There was hardly a bedroom in the house where feminine compliments were not passing and feminine toilettes going forward, in various stages, in space made scanty by extra beds spread upon the floor, and Miss Nancy, as she entered the blue room, had to make her little formal curtsy to a group of six. On the one hand, there were ladies no less important than the two Miss Guns, the wine-merchant's daughters from Lytherly, dressed in the height of fashion, with the tightest skirts and the shortest waists, and gazed at by Miss Ladbrook, of the old pastures, with a shyness not unsustained by inward criticism. Partly, Miss Ladbrook felt that her own skirt must be regarded as unduly lax by the Miss Guns, and partly that it was a pity the Miss Guns did not show that judgment which she herself would show if she were in their place, by stopping a little on this side of the fashion. Mrs. Ladbrook was standing in skull-cap in front, with her turban in her hand, curtsying and smiling blandly, and saying, "'After you, ma'am,' to another lady in similar circumstances, who had politely offered the precedence at the looking-glass. But Miss Nancy had no sooner made her curtsy than an elderly lady came forward, whose full white muslin kerchief and mob-cap round her curls of smooth grey hair were in daring contrast with the puffed yellow satins and top-knotted caps of her neighbours. She approached Miss Nancy with much primness, and said, with a slow, treble suavity, "'Niece, I hope I see you well in health.' Miss Nancy kissed her aunt's cheek dutifully, and answered, with the same sort of amiable primness, "'Quite well, I thank you, aunt, and I hope I see you the same.' "'Thank you, niece. I keep my health for the present. And how is my brother-in-law?' These dutiful questions and answers were continued until it was ascertained in detail that the Lammeters were all as well as usual, and the Osgoods likewise. Also that niece Priscilla must certainly arrive shortly, and that travelling on pillions in snowy weather was unpleasant, though a Joseph was a great protection. 
Then Nancy was formally introduced to her aunt's visitors, the Miss Gunns, as being the daughters of a mother known to their mother, though now for the first time induced to make a journey into these parts, and these ladies were so taken by surprise at finding such a lovely face and figure in an out-of-the-way country place, that they began to feel some curiosity about the dress she would put on when she took off her Joseph. Miss Nancy, whose thoughts were always conducted with the propriety and moderation conspicuous in her manners, remarked to herself that the Miss Gunns were rather hard-featured than otherwise, and that such very low dresses as they wore might have been attributed to vanity if their shoulders had been pretty, but that, being as they were, it was not reasonable to suppose that they showed their necks from a love of display, but rather from some obligation not inconsistent with sense and modesty. She felt convinced, as she opened her box, that this must be her aunt Osgood's opinion, for Miss Nancy's mind resembled her aunt's to a degree that everybody said was surprising, considering the kinship was on Mr. Osgood's side, and though you might not have supposed it from the formality of their greeting, there was a devoted attachment and mutual admiration between aunt and niece. Even Miss Nancy's refusal of her cousin Gilbert Osgood, on the ground solely that he was her cousin, though it had grieved her aunt greatly, had not in the least cooled the preference which had determined her to leave Nancy several of her hereditary ornaments, let Gilbert's future wife be whom she might. Three of the ladies quickly retired, but the Miss Gunns were quite content that Mrs. Osgood's inclination to remain with her niece gave them also a reason for staying to see the rustic beauty's toilette and it was really a pleasure, from the first opening of the bandbox, where everything smelt of lavender and rose-leaves, to the clasping of the small coral necklace that fitted closely round her little white neck. Everything belonging to Miss Nancy was of delicate purity and nattiness, not a crease where it had no business to be, not a bit of her linen professed whiteness without fulfilling its profession. The very pins of her pincushion were stuck in after a pattern from which she was careful to allow no aberration, and as for her own person, it gave the same idea of perfect unvarying neatness as the body of a little bird. It is true that her light brown hair was cropped behind like a boy's, and was dressed in front, in a number of flat rings that lay quite away from her face, but there was no sort of coiffure that could make Miss Nancy's cheek and neck look otherwise than pretty and when at last she stood complete in her silvery twilled silk, her lace tucker, her coral necklace, and coral ear-drops, the Miss Gunns could see nothing to criticize except her hands, which bore the traces of butter-making, cheese-crushing, and even still coarser work. But Miss Nancy was not ashamed of that, for even while she was dressing she narrated to her aunt how she and Priscilla had packed their boxes yesterday, because this morning was baking morning, and since they were leaving home it was desirable to make a good supply of meat-pies for the kitchen. And as she concluded this judicious remark, she turned to the Miss Gunns that she might not commit the rudeness of not including them in the conversation. The Miss Gunns smiled stiffly, and thought what a pity it was that these rich country people, who could afford to buy such good clothes—really Miss Nancy's lace and silk were very costly—should be brought up in utter ignorance and vulgarity. She actually said mate for meat, appen for perhaps, and oss for horse, which, to young ladies living in good litherly society, who habitually said orse, even in domestic privacy, and only said appen on the right occasions, was necessarily shocking. Miss Nancy, indeed, had never been to any school higher than Dame Tedman's. Her acquaintance with profane literature hardly went beyond the rhymes she had worked in her large sampler under the lamb and the shepherdess, and in order to balance an account, she was obliged to effect her subtraction by removing visible metallic shillings and sixpences from a visible metallic total. There is hardly a servant-maid in these days who is not better informed than Miss Nancy, yet she had the essential attributes of a lady, high veracity, delicate honour in her dealings, deference to others, and refined personal habits, and lest these should not suffice to convince grammatical fair ones that her feelings can at all resemble theirs, I will add that she was slightly proud and exacting, and as constant in her affection towards a baseless opinion as towards an erring lover. 
the anxiety about sister Priscilla, which had grown rather active by the time the coral necklace was clasped, was happily ended by the entrance of that cheerful-looking lady herself, with a face made blowsy by cold and damp. After the first questions and greetings, she turned to Nancy, and surveyed her from head to foot, then wheeled her round, to ascertain that the back view was equally faultless. "'What do you think of these gowns, Aunt Osgood?' said Priscilla, while Nancy helped her to unrobe. "'Very handsome indeed, niece,' said Mrs. Osgood, with a slight increase of formality. She always thought niece Priscilla too rough. "'I'm obliged to have the same as Nancy, you know, for all I'm five years older, and it makes me look yellow, for she never will have anything without I have mine just like it, because she wants us to look like sisters. And I tell her, folks'll think it's my weakness makes me fancy as I shall look pretty in what she looks pretty in. For I am ugly, there's no denying that. I feature my father's family. But, law, I don't mind, do you?' Priscilla here turned to the Miss Guns, rattling on in too much preoccupation with the delight of talking, to notice that her candour was not appreciated. "'The pretty ends do for fly-catchers. They keep the men off us. I've no opinion of the men, Miss Gunn. I don't know what you have. And as for fretting and stewing about what they'll think of you from morning till night, and making your life uneasy about what they're doing when they're out of your sight, as I tell Nancy, it's a folly no woman need be guilty of if she's got a good father, and a good home. Let her leave it to them as have got no fortin, and can't help themselves. As I say, Mr. Have Your Own Way is the best husband, and the only one I'd ever promise to obey. I know it isn't pleasant, when you've been used to living in a big way, and managing hogsheads and all that, to go and put your nose in by somebody else's fireside, or to sit down by yourself to a scrag or a knuckle. But, thank God, my father's a sober man and likely to live, and if you've got a man by the chimney-corner, it doesn't matter if he's childish. The business needn't be broke up. The delicate process of getting her narrow gown over her head without injury to her smooth curls obliged Miss Priscilla to pause in this rapid survey of life, and Mrs. Osgood seized the opportunity of rising and saying, "'Well, niece, you'll follow us. The Miss Guns will like to go down.' "'Sister,' said Nancy, when they were alone, "'you've offended the Miss Guns, I'm sure.' "'What have I done, child?' said Priscilla, in some alarm. "'Why, you asked them if they minded about being ugly. You're so very blunt.' "'Law, did I? Well, it popped out. It's a mercy I said no more, for I'm a bad un to live with folks when they don't like the truth. But as for being ugly, look at me, child, in this silver-coloured silk. I told you how it'd be. I look as yellow as a daffodil. Anybody'd say you wanted to make a mockin' of me.' "'No, Prissy, don't say so. I begged and prayed of you not to let us have this silk if you'd like another better.' "'I was willing to have your choice. You know I was,' said Nancy, in anxious self-vindication. "'Nonsense, child. You know you'd set your heart on this, and reason good, for you're the colour o' cream. It'd be fine doings for you to dress yourself to suit my skin. What I find fault with is that notion of yours as I must dress myself just like you. But you do as you like with me. You always did, from when first you begun to walk.' If you wanted to go the field's length, the field's length you'd go, and there was no whipping you, for you looked as prim and innocent as a daisy all the while. Prissy, said Nancy, gently, as she fastened a coral necklace, exactly like her own, round Priscilla's neck, which was very far from being like her own, I'm sure I'm willing to give way as far as is right, but who shouldn't dress alike if it isn't sisters? Would you have us go about looking as if we were no kin to one another? us that have got no mother and not another sister in the world. I'd do what was right if I dressed in a gown dyed with cheese colouring, and I'd rather you'd choose and let me wear what pleases you. There you go again. You'd come round to the same thing if one talked to you from Saturday night till Saturday morning. It'll be fine fun to see how you'll master your husband and never raise your voice above the singing of the kettle all the while. I like to see the men mastered. "'Don't talk so, Prissy,' said Nancy, blushing. "'You know I don't mean ever to be married.' "'Oh, you never mean a fiddlestick's end,' said Priscilla, as she arranged her discarded dress and closed her bandbox. "'Who shall I have to work for when father's gone, if you are to go and take notions in your head and be an old maid, because some folks are no better than they should be? I haven't a bit of patience with you.' 
sitting on an addled egg for ever, as if there was never a freshen in the world. One old maid's enough out of two sisters, and I shall do credit to a single life, for God Almighty meant it for me. Come, we can go down now. I'm as ready as a mockin' can be. There's nothing a-wanting to frighten the crows, now I've got my ear-droppers in." As the two Miss Lammeters walked into the large parlour together, any one who did not know the character of both might certainly have supposed that the reason why the square-shouldered, clumsy, high-featured Priscilla wore a dress the facsimile of her pretty sisters was either the mistaken vanity of the one, or the malicious contrivance of the other, in order to set off her own rare beauty. But the good-natured, self-forgetful cheeriness and common sense of Priscilla would soon have dissipated the one suspicion and the modest calm of Nancy's speech and manners told clearly of a mind free from all disavowed devices. Places of honour had been kept for the Miss Lammeters near the head of the principal tea-table in the wainscoted parlour, now looking fresh and pleasant with handsome branches of holly, yew, and laurel, from the abundant growths of the old garden, and Nancy felt an inward flutter that no firmness of purpose could prevent when she saw Mr. Godfrey Cass advancing to lead her to a seat between himself and Mr. Crackenthorpe, while Priscilla was called to the opposite side between her father and the squire. It certainly did make some difference to Nancy that the lover she had given up was the young man of quite the highest consequence in the parish, at home in a venerable and unique parlour which was the extremity of grandeur in her experience, a parlour where she might one day have been mistress, with the consciousness that she was spoken of as Madame Cass, the squire's wife. These circumstances exalted her inward drama in her own eyes, and deepened the emphasis with which she declared to herself that not the most dazzling rank should induce her to marry a man whose conduct showed him careless of his character, but that, Love once, love always, was the motto of a true and pure woman, and no man should ever have any right over her which would be a call on her to destroy the dried flowers that she treasured, and always would treasure, for Godfrey Cass's sake. And Nancy was capable of keeping her word to herself under very trying conditions. Nothing but a becoming blush betrayed the moving thoughts that urged themselves upon her as she accepted the seat next to Mr. Crackenthorpe for she was so instinctively neat and adroit in all her actions, and her pretty lips met each other with such quiet firmness, that it would have been difficult for her to appear agitated. It was not the rector's practice to let a charming blush pass without an appropriate compliment. He was not in the least lofty or aristocratic, but simply a merry-eyed, small-featured, grey-haired man, with his chin propped by an ample, many-creased white neckcloth, which seemed to predominate over every other point in his person, and somehow to impress its peculiar character on his remarks, so that to have considered his amenities apart from his cravat would have been a severe, and perhaps a dangerous, effort of abstraction. "'Ha! Ah, Miss Nancy,' he said, turning his head within his cravat, and smiling down pleasantly upon her, "'when anybody pretends this has been a severe winter, I shall tell them I saw the roses blooming on New Year's Eve. Eh, hey, Godfrey, what do you say?' Godfrey made no reply, and avoided looking at Nancy very markedly, for though these complimentary personalities were held to be an excellent taste in old-fashioned Ravelo society, reverend love has a politeness of its own which it teaches to men otherwise of small schooling. But the squire was rather impatient at Godfrey's showing himself a dull spark in this way. By this advanced hour of the day, the squire was always in higher spirits than we have seen him in at the breakfast-table, and felt it quite pleasant to fulfil the hereditary duty of being noisily jovial and patronising. The large silver snuff-box was in active service, and was offered without fail to all neighbours from time to time, however often they might have declined the favour. At present, the squire had only given an express welcome to the heads of families as they appeared, but always, as the evening deepened, his hospitality rayed out more widely, till he had tapped the youngest guests on the back and shown a peculiar fondness for their presence, in the full belief that they must feel their lives made happy by their belonging to a parish where there was such a hardy man as Squire Cass to invite them and wish them well. Even in this early stage of the jovial mood, it was natural that he should wish to supply his son's deficiencies by looking and speaking for him. "'Aye, aye,' he began, offering his snuff-box to Mr. Lammeter, 
who for the second time bowed his head and waved his hand in stiff rejection of the offer. "'Us old fellows may wish ourselves young to-night, when we see the mistletoe bow in the white parlour. It's true, most things are gone backward these last thirty years. The country's going down since the king fell ill. But when I look at Miss Nancy here, I begin to think that the lasses keep up their quality. Ding me if I remember a sample to match her, not when I was a fine young fellow, and thought a deal about my pigtail.' "'No offence to you, madam,' he added, bending to Mrs. Crackenthorpe, who sat by him. "'I didn't know you when you were as young as Miss Nancy here.' Mrs. Crackenthorpe, a small, blinking woman, who fidgeted incessantly with her lace, ribbons, and gold chain, turning her head about and making subdued noises, very much like a guinea-pig that twitches its nose and soliloquizes in all company indiscriminately, now blinked and fidgeted towards the squire, and said, "'Oh, no, no offence. This emphatic compliment of the squire's to Nancy was felt by others besides Godfrey to have a diplomatic significance, and her father gave a slight additional erectness to his back as he looked across the table at her with complacent gravity. That grave and orderly senior was not going to bait a jot of his dignity by seeming elated at the notion of a match between his family and the squire's. He was gratified by any honour paid to his daughter." but he must see an alteration in several ways before his consent could be vouchsafed. His spare but healthy person, and high-featured, firm face, that looked as if it had never been flushed by excess, was in strong contrast, not only with the squires, but with the appearance of the Ravelo farmers generally, in accordance with a favourite saying of his own that breed was stronger than pasture. "'Miss Nancy's wonderful like what her mother was, though, isn't she, Kimball?' said the stout lady of that name, looking round for her husband. But Dr. Kimball, country apothecaries in the old days enjoyed that title without authority of diploma, being a thin and agile man, was flitting about the room with his hands in his pockets, making himself agreeable to his feminine patients, with medical impartiality, and being welcomed everywhere as a doctor by hereditary right, not one of those miserable apothecaries who canvass for practice in strange neighbourhoods, and spend all their income in starving their one horse, but a man of substance, able to keep an extravagant table like the best of his patients. Time out of mind the Ravelo doctor had been a Kimball. Kimball was inherently a doctor's name, and it was difficult to contemplate firmly the melancholy fact that the actual Kimball had no son, so that his practice might one day be handed over to a successor with the incongruous name of Taylor or Johnson. But in that case the wiser people in Ravelo would employ Dr. Blick, of Blitton, as less unnatural. "'Did you speak to me, my dear?' said the authentic doctor, coming quickly to his wife's side, but, as if foreseeing that she would be too much out of breath to repeat her remark, he went on immediately. "'Ha! Ah, Miss Priscilla, the sight of you revives the taste of that super-excellent pork-pie. I hope the batch isn't near an end.' "'Yes, indeed it is, doctor,' said Priscilla, "'but I'll answer for the next shall be as good. My pork-pies don't turn out well by chance.' "'Not as your doctoring does, eh, Kimball, because folks forget to take your physic, eh?' said the squire, who regarded physic and doctors, as many loyal churchmen regard the church and the clergy, tasting a joke against them when he was in health, but impatiently eager for their aid when anything was the matter with him. He tapped his box, and looked round with a triumphant laugh. "'Ah, she has a quick wit, my friend Priscilla has,' said the doctor, choosing to attribute the epigram to a lady rather than allow a brother-in-law that advantage over him. She saves a little pepper to sprinkle over her talk. That's the reason why she never puts too much into her pies. There's my wife now. She never has an answer at her tongue's end. But if I offend her, she's sure to scarify my throat with black pepper the next day, or else give me the colic with watery greens. That's an awful tit-for-tat. Here the vivacious doctor made a pathetic grimace. "'Did you ever hear the like?' said Mrs. Kimball, laughing above her double chin with much good humour, aside to Mrs. Crackenthorpe, who blinked and nodded, and seemed to intend a smile, which, by the correlation of forces, went off in small twitchings and noises. "'I suppose that's the sort of tit-for-tat adopted in your profession, Kimball, if you've a grudge against a patient,' said the rector. "'Never do have a grudge against our patients,' said Mr. Kimball, "'except when they leave us, and then, you see, we haven't the chance of prescribing for em. 
"'Ha! Ah, Miss Nancy,' he continued, suddenly skipping to Nancy's side, "'you won't forget your promise. You're to save a dance for me, you know.' "'Come, come, Kimball, don't you be too forward,' said the squire. "'Give the young uns fair play. There's my son Godfrey'll be wanting to have a round with you if you've run off with Miss Nancy. He's bespoke her for the first dance, I'll be bound. Eh, sir, what do you say?' he continued, throwing himself backward and looking at Godfrey. "'Haven't you asked Miss Nancy to open the dance with you?' Godfrey, sorely uncomfortable under this significant insistence about Nancy, and afraid to think where it would end by the time his father had set his usual hospitable example of drinking before and after supper, saw no course open but to turn to Nancy and say, with as little awkwardness as possible, "'No, I've not asked her yet, but I hope she'll consent, if someone else hasn't been before me.' "'No, I've not engaged myself,' said Nancy, quietly, though blushingly. "'If Mr. Godfrey found any hopes on her consenting to dance with him, he would soon be undeceived, but there was no need for her to be uncivil.' "'Then I hope you've no objections to dancing with me,' said Godfrey, beginning to lose the sense that there was anything uncomfortable in this arrangement. "'No, no objections.' said Nancy, in a cold tone. "'Ah, well, you're a lucky fellow, Godfrey,' said Uncle Kimball. "'But you're my godson, so I won't stand in your way. Else I'm not so very old, eh, my dear?' he went on, skipping to his wife's side again. "'You wouldn't mind my having a second after you were gone, not if I cried a good deal first. "'Come, come, take a cup of tea and stop your tongue, do,' said good-humoured Mrs. Kimball, feeling some pride in a husband who must be regarded as so clever and amusing by the company generally, if he had only not been irritable at cards. While safe, well-tested personalities were enlivening the tea in this way, the sound of the fiddle approaching within a distance at which it could be heard distinctly made the young people look at each other with sympathetic impatience for the end of the meal. "'Why, there's Solomon in the hall,' said the squire, "'and playing my favourite tune, I believe, the flaxen-headed ploughboy. "'He's for giving us a hint, as we aren't enough in a hurry to hear him play. "'Bob,' he called out to his third long-legged son, who was at the other end of the room, "'open the door and tell Solomon to come in. He shall give us a tune here.' "'Bob obeyed, and Solomon walked in, fiddling as he walked, "'for he would on no account break off in the middle of a tune.' "'Here, Solomon,' said the squire, with loud patronage, "'round here, my man. Ah, I knew it was the flaxen-headed ploughboy. There's no finer tune.' Solomon Macy, a small, hale old man with an abundant crop of long white hair reaching nearly to his shoulders, advanced to the indicated spot, bowing reverently while he fiddled, as much as to say that he respected the company, though he respected the keynote more. As soon as he had repeated the tune and lowered his fiddle, he bowed again to the squire and the rector, and said, "'I hope I see your honour and your reverence well, and wishing you health and long life, and a happy new year, and wishing the same to you, Mr. Lameter, sir, and to the other gentlemen, and the madams, and the young lasses.' As Solomon uttered the last words, he bowed in all directions solicitously, lest he should be wanting in due respect. But thereupon he immediately began to prelude, and fell into the tune which he knew would be taken as a special compliment by Mr. Lameter. "'Thank ye, Solomon, thank ye,' said Mr. Lameter, when the fiddle paused again. "'That's over the hills and far away, that is. My father used to say to me, whenever we heard that tune, "'Ah, lad, I come from over the hills and far away. There's a many tunes I don't make head or tail of, but that speaks to me like the blackbird's whistle. I suppose it's the name. There's a deal in the name of a tune.' But Solomon was already impatient to prelude again, and presently broke with much spirit into Sir Roger de Coverley, at which there was a sound of chairs pushed back, and laughing voices. "'Ay, ay, Solomon, we know what that means,' said the squire, rising. "'It's time to begin the dance, eh? Lead the way, then, and we'll all follow you.' So Solomon, holding his white head on one side, and playing vigorously, marched forward at the head of the gay procession into the white parlour, where the mistletoe bough was hung, and multitudinous tallow candles made rather a brilliant effect, gleaming from among the buried holly boughs, and reflected in the old-fashioned oval mirrors, fastened in the panels of the white wainscot. 
A quaint procession. Old Solomon, in his seedy clothes and long white locks, seemed to be luring that decent company by the magic scream of his fiddle, luring discreet matrons in turban-shaped caps, nay, Mrs. Crackenthorpe herself, the summit of whose perpendicular feather was on a level with the squire's shoulder, luring fair lasses complacently conscious of very short waists and skirts blameless of front folds, luring burly fathers in large variegated waistcoats, and ruddy sons, for the most part shy and sheepish, in short neither garments and very long coat-tails. Already Mr. Macy and a few other privileged villagers, who were allowed to be spectators on these great occasions, were seated on benches placed for them near the door, and great was the admiration and satisfaction in that quarter when the couples had formed themselves for the dance, and the squire led off with Mrs. Crackenthorpe, joining hands with the rector and Mrs. Osgood. That was as it should be, that was what everybody had been used to, and the charter of Ravelo seemed to be renewed by the ceremony. It was not thought of as an unbecoming levity for the old and middle-aged people to dance a little before sitting down to cards, but rather as part of their social duties. For what were these if not to be merry at appropriate times, interchanging visits and poultry with due frequency, paying each other their old established compliments in sound traditional phrases, passing well-tried personal jokes, urging your guests to eat and drink too much out of hospitality, and eating and drinking too much in your neighbor's house to show that you liked your cheer. And the parson naturally set an example in these social duties, for it would not have been possible for the Ravelow mind, without a peculiar revelation, to know that a clergyman should be a pale-faced memento of solemnities, instead of a reasonably faulty man, whose exclusive authority to read prayers and preach, to christen, marry, and bury you, necessarily coexisted with the right to sell you the ground to be buried in, and to take tithe in kind, on which last point, of course, there was a little grumbling, but not to the extent of irreligion, not of deeper significance than the grumbling at the rain, which was by no means accompanied with a spirit of impious defiance, but with a desire that the prayer for fine weather might be read forthwith. There was no reason, then, why the rector's dancing should not be received as part of the fitness of things quite as much as the squire's, or why, on the other hand, Mr. Macy's official respect should restrain him from subjecting the parson's performance to that criticism with which minds of extraordinary acuteness must necessarily contemplate the doings of their fallible fellow-men. "'The squire's pretty sprange, considering his weight,' said Mr. Macy, and he stamps uncommon well. But Mr. Lameter beats him all for shapes. You see, he holds his head like a soldier, and he isn't so cushiony as most of the old gentlefolks. They run fat in general, and he's got a fine leg. The parson's nimble enough, but he hasn't got much of a leg. It's a bit too thick downard, and his knees might be a bit nearer without damage, but he might do worse. He might do worse, though he hasn't that grand way o' waving his hand as the squire has. "'Talk a nimbleness, look at Mrs. Osgood,' said Ben Winthrop, who was holding his son Aaron between his knees. "'She trips along with her little steps, so as nobody can see how she goes. It's like as if she had little wheels to her feet. She doesn't look a day older nor last year. She's the finest made woman as is, let the next be where she will.' "'I don't heed how the women are made,' said Mrs. Macy, with some contempt. "'They wear neither coat nor breeches. You can't make much out of their shapes.' Father, said Aaron, whose feet were busy beating out the tune, how does that big cock's feather stick in Mrs. Crackenthorpe's yed? Is there a little hole for it, like in my shuttlecock? Hush, lad, hush. That's the way the ladies dress themselves, that is, said the father, adding, however, in an undertone to Mr. Macy. It does make her look funny, though, partly like a short-necked bottle with a long quill in it. Hey, by Jingo, there's the young squire leading off now, with Miss Nancy for partners. There's a lass for you, like a pink and white posy. There's nobody you'd think as anybody could be so pretty. I shouldn't wonder if she's Madame Cass some day, arter all. And nobody more rightfuller, for they'd make a fine match. You can find nothing against Master Godfrey's shapes, Macy. I'll bet a penny. Mr. Macy screwed up his mouth leaned his head further on one side, and twirled his thumbs with a presto movement as his eyes followed Godfrey up the dance. At last he summed up his opinion. Pretty well downard, but a bit too round in the shoulder-blades. 
and as for them coats he gets from the flittin' tailor, they're a poor cut to pay double money for. "'Ah, Mr. Macy, you and me are two folks,' said Ben, slightly indignant at this carping. "'When I've got a pot of good ale, I like to swallow it, and do my inside good, instead of smelling and staring at it to see if I can't find fault with the brewing. I should like you to pick me out a finer-limbed young fellow nor Master Godfrey, one as it knock you down easier, or's more presenter looks when he's peert and merry. Tcha! said Mr. Macy, provoked to increased severity. He isn't come to his right colour yet. He's partly like a slack-baked pie, and I doubt he's got a soft place in his head, else why should he be turned round the finger by that awful duncey as nobody's seen a late, and let him kill that fine hunting oss as was the talk of the country? and one while he was always after Miss Nancy, and then it all went off again, like a smell o' hot porridge, as I may say. That wasn't my way when I went to courting. "'Ah, but mayhap Miss Nancy hung off like, and your lass didn't,' said Ben. "'I should say she didn't,' said Mr. Macy, significantly. "'Before I said sniff, I took care to know as she'd say snaff, and pretty quick, too.' I wasn't a-going to open my mouth like a dog at a fly and snap it too again, with nothing to swaller. "'Well, I think Miss Nancy's coming around again,' said Ben, "'for Master Godfrey doesn't look so downhearted to-night, and I see he's for taking her away to sit down. Now they're at the end of the dance. That looks like sweethearting, that does.' The reason why Godfrey and Nancy had left the dance was not so tender as Ben imagined. In the close press of couples a slight accident had happened to Nancy's dress, which, while it was short enough to show her neat ankle in front, was long enough behind to be caught under the stately stamp of the squire's foot, so as to rend certain stitches at the waist, and cause much sisterly agitation in Priscilla's mind, as well as serious concern in Nancy's. One's thoughts may be much occupied with love-struggles, but hardly so as to be insensible to a disorder in the general framework of things. Nancy had no sooner completed her duty in the figure they were dancing than she said to Godfrey, with a deep blush, that she must go and sit down till Priscilla could come to her, for the sisters had already exchanged a short whisper and an open-eyed glance, full of meaning. No reason less urgent than this could have prevailed upon Nancy to give Godfrey this opportunity of sitting apart with her. As for Godfrey, he was feeling so happy and oblivious under the long charm of the country dance with Nancy, that he got rather bold on the strength of her confusion, and was capable of leading her straight away, without leave asked, into the adjoining small parlour, where the card-tables were set. "'Oh, no, thank you,' said Nancy, coldly, as soon as she perceived where he was going. "'Not in there. I'll wait here till Priscilla's ready to come to me. I'm sorry to bring you out of the dance and make myself troublesome.' "'Why, you'll be more comfortable here by yourself,' said the artful Godfrey. "'I'll leave you here till your sister can come.' He spoke in an indifferent tone. That was an agreeable proposition, and just what Nancy desired. Why, then, was she a little hurt that Mr. Godfrey should make it? They entered, and she seated herself on a chair against one of the card-tables, as the stiffest and most unapproachable position she could choose. "'Thank you, sir,' she said immediately. "'I needn't give you any more trouble. I'm sorry you've had such an unlucky partner.' "'That's very ill-natured of you,' said Godfrey, standing by her without any sign of intended departure, "'to be sorry you've danced with me.' "'Oh, no, sir, I don't mean to say what's ill-natured at all,' said Nancy, looking distractingly prim and pretty. "'When gentlemen have so many pleasures, one dance can matter but very little.' "'You know that isn't true. You know one dance with you matters more to me than all the other pleasures in the world.' It was a long, long while since Godfrey had said anything so direct as that, and Nancy was startled but her instinctive dignity and repugnance to any show of emotion made her sit perfectly still, and only throw a little more decision into her voice, as she said, "'No, indeed, Mr. Godfrey, that's not known to me, and I have very good reasons for thinking different. But if it's true, I don't wish to hear it.' "'Would you never forgive me, then, Nancy? Never think well of me? Let what would happen. Would you never think the present made amends for the past?' not if I turned a good fellow, and gave up everything you didn't like. Godfrey was half conscious that this sudden opportunity of speaking to Nancy alone had driven him beside himself, 
but blind feeling had got the mastery of his tongue. Nancy really felt much agitated by the possibility Godfrey's words suggested, but this very pressure of emotion that she was in danger of finding too strong for her roused all her power of self-command. "'I should be glad to see a good change in anybody, Mr. Godfrey,' she answered, with the slightest discernible difference of tone, but it'd be better if no change was wanted. "'You're very hard-hearted, Nancy,' said Godfrey, pettishly. "'You might encourage me to be a better fellow. I'm very miserable. But you've no feeling.' "'I think those have the least feeling that act wrong to begin with,' said Nancy, sending out a flash in spite of herself. Godfrey was delighted with that little flash, and would have liked to go on and make her quarrel with him. Nancy was so exasperatingly quiet and firm. But she was not indifferent to him yet, though the entrance of Priscilla, bustling forward and saying, "'Dear heart alive, child, let us look at this gown,' cut off Godfrey's hopes of a quarrel. "'I suppose I must go now,' he said to Priscilla. "'It's no matter to me whether you go or stay.' said that frank lady, searching for something in her pocket, with a preoccupied brow. "'Do you want me to go?' said Godfrey, looking at Nancy, who was now standing up by Priscilla's order. "'As you like,' said Nancy, trying to recover all her former coldness, and looking down carefully at the hem of her gown. "'Then I like to stay,' said Godfrey, with a reckless determination to get as much of this joy as he could to-night, and think nothing of the morrow." End of chapter 11「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. » Silas Marner, The Weaver of Ravelo by George Eliot Chapter Twelve. While Godfrey Cass was taking draughts of forgetfulness from the sweet presence of Nancy, willingly losing all sense of that hidden bond which at other moments galled and fretted him so as to mingle irritation with the very sunshine, Godfrey's wife was walking with slow, uncertain steps through the snow-covered Ravelo lanes, carrying her child in her arms. This journey, on New Year's Eve, was a premeditated act of vengeance which she had kept in her heart ever since Godfrey, in a fit of passion, had told her he would sooner die than acknowledge her as his wife. There would be a great party at the Red House on New Year's Eve, she knew. Her husband would be smiling and smiled upon, hiding her existence in the darkest corner of his heart. But she would mar his pleasure— she would go in her dingy rags, with her faded face, once as handsome as the best, with her little child that had its father's hair and eyes, and disclose herself to the squire as his eldest son's wife. It is seldom that the miserable can help regarding their misery as a wrong inflicted by those who are less miserable. Molly knew that the cause of her dingy rags was not her husband's neglect, but the demon opium, to whom she was enslaved, body and soul, except in the lingering mother's tenderness that refused to give him her hungry child. She knew this well, and yet, in the moments of wretched unbenumbed consciousness, the sense of her want and degradation transformed itself continually into bitterness towards Godfrey. He was well off, and if she had her rights, she would be well off too. The belief that he repented his marriage, and suffered from it, only aggravated her vindictiveness. Just and self-reproving thoughts do not come to us too thickly, even in the purest air, and with the best lessons of heaven and earth. How should those white-winged delicate messengers make their way to Molly's poisoned chamber, inhabited by no higher memories than those of a barmaid's paradise of pink ribbons and gentlemen's jokes. She had set out at an early hour, but had lingered on the road, inclined by her indolence to believe that if she waited under a warm shed the snow would cease to fall. She had waited longer than she knew, and now that she found herself belated in the snow-hidden ruggedness of the long lanes, even the animation of a vindictive purpose could not keep her spirit from failing. It was seven o'clock, 
and by this time she was not very far from Ravelow, but she was not familiar enough with those monotonous lanes to know how near she was to her journey's end. She needed comfort, and she knew but one comforter, the familiar demon in her bosom, but she hesitated a moment, after drawing out the black remnant, before she raised it to her lips. In that moment the mother's love pleaded for painful consciousness rather than oblivion, pleaded to be left in aching weariness, rather than to have the encircled arms be numbed so that they could not feel the dear burden. In another moment Molly had flung something away, but it was not the black remnant, it was an empty file. And she walked on again under the breaking cloud, from which there came now and then the light of a quickly veiled star, for a freezing wind had sprung up since the snowing had ceased. But she walked always more and more drowsily, and clutched more and more automatically the sleeping child at her bosom. Slowly the demon was working his will, and cold and weariness were his helpers. Soon she felt nothing but a supreme immediate longing that curtained off all futurity, the longing to lie down and sleep. She had arrived at a spot where her footsteps were no longer checked by a hedgerow, and she had wandered vaguely, unable to distinguish any objects, notwithstanding the wide whiteness around her and the growing starlight. She sank down against a straggling furze bush, an easy pillow enough, and the bed of snow, too, was soft. She did not feel that the bed was cold, and did not heed whether the child would wake and cry for her. But her arms had not yet relaxed their instinctive clutch, and the little one slumbered on as gently as if it had been rocked in a lace-trimmed cradle. But the complete torpor came at last, the fingers lost their tension, the arms unbent, then the little head fell away from the bosom, and the blue eyes opened wide on the cold starlight. At first there was a little peevish cry of, Mammy, and an effort to regain the pillowing arm and bosom, but Mammy's ear was deaf, and the pillow seemed to be slipping away backward. Suddenly, as the child rolled downward on its mother's knees, all wet with snow, its eyes were caught by a bright glancing light on the white ground, and, with the ready transition of infancy, it was immediately absorbed in watching the bright living thing running towards it, yet never arriving. That bright living thing must be caught, and in an instant the child had slipped on all fours and held out one little hand to catch the gleam but the gleam would not be caught in that way, and now the head was held up to see where the cunning gleam came from. It came from a very bright place, and the little one, rising on its legs, toddled through the snow, the old grimy shawl in which it was wrapped trailing behind it, and the queer little bonnet dangling at its back, toddled on to the open door of Silas Marner's cottage, and right up to the warm hearth where there was a bright fire of logs and sticks, which had thoroughly warmed the old sack, Silas's greatcoat, spread out on the bricks to dry. The little one, accustomed to be left to itself for long hours without notice from its mother, squatted down on the sack, and spread its tiny hands toward the blaze, in perfect contentment, gurgling and making many inarticulate communications to the cheerful fire, like a new hatched gosling beginning to find itself comfortable. But presently the warmth had a lulling effect, and the little golden head sank down on the old sack, and the blue eyes were veiled by their delicate, half-transparent lids. But where was Silas Marner while this strange visitor had come to his hearth? He was in the cottage, but he did not see the child. During the last few weeks, since he had lost his money, he had contracted the habit of opening his door and looking out from time to time, as if he thought that his money might be somehow coming back to him, or that some trace, some news of it, might be mysteriously on the road, and be caught by the listening ear or the straining eye. It was chiefly at night, when he was not occupied in his loom, that he fell into this repetition of an act for which he could have assigned no definite purpose, and which can hardly be understood except by those who have undergone a bewildering separation from a supremely loved object. In the evening twilight, and later whenever the night was not dark, Silas looked out on that narrow prospect round the stone pits, listening and gazing, not with hope, but with mere yearning and unrest. This morning he had been told by some of his neighbours that it was New Year's Eve, and that he must sit up and hear the old year rung out and the new rung in, because that was good luck, and might bring his money back again. 
This was only a friendly Ravelow way of jesting with the half-crazy oddities of a miser, but it had perhaps helped to throw Silas into a more than usually excited state. Since the oncoming of twilight he had opened his door again and again, though only to shut it immediately at seeing all distance veiled by the falling snow. But the last time he opened it the snow had ceased, and the clouds were parting here and there. He stood and listened, and gazed for a long while. There was really something on the road coming towards him then, but he caught no sign of it, and the stillness and the wide, trackless snow seemed to narrow his solitude, and touched his yearning with the chill of despair. He went in again, and put his right hand on the latch of the door to close it. But he did not close it. He was arrested, as he had been already since his loss, by the invisible wand of catalepsy, and stood like a graven image, with wide but sightless eyes, holding open his door, powerless to resist either the good or the evil that might enter there. When Marner's sensibility returned, he continued the action which had been arrested, and closed the door, unaware of the chasm in his consciousness, unaware of any intermediate change, except that the light had grown dim, and that he was chilled and faint. He thought he had been too long standing at the door and looking out. Turning towards the hearth, where the two logs had fallen apart and sent forth only a red, uncertain glimmer, he seated himself on his fireside chair, and was stooping to push his logs together, when, to his blurred vision, it seemed as if there were gold on the floor in front of the hearth. Gold! His own gold! Brought back to him as mysteriously as it had been taken away! He felt his heart began to beat violently, and for a few moments he was unable to stretch out his hand and grasp the restored treasure. The heap of gold seemed to glow and get larger beneath his agitated gaze. He leaned forward at last, and stretched forth his hand, but instead of the hard coin with the familiar resisting outline, his fingers encountered soft, warm curls. In utter amazement, Silas fell on his knees and bent his head low to examine the marvel, it was a sleeping child, a round, fair thing, with soft yellow rings all over its head. Could this be his little sister come back to him in a dream, his little sister whom he had carried about in his arms for a year before she died, when he was a small boy without shoes or stockings? That was the first thought that darted across Silas's blank wonderment. Was it a dream? He rose to his feet again, pushed his logs together, and, throwing on some dried leaves and sticks, raised a flame, but the flame did not disperse the vision, it only lit up more distinctly the little round form of the child, and its shabby clothing. It was very much like his little sister. Silas sank into his chair powerless, under the double presence of an inexplicable surprise and a hurrying influx of memories. How and when had the child come in without his knowledge? He had never been beyond the door. But along with that question, and almost thrusting it away, there was a vision of the old home and the old streets leading to Lantern Yard, and within that vision another, of the thoughts which had been present with him in those far-off scenes. The thoughts were strange to him now, like old friendships impossible to revive, and yet he had a dreamy feeling that this child was somehow a message come to him from that far-off life. It stirred fibres that had never been moved in Ravelo, old quiverings of tenderness, old impressions of awe at the presentiment of some power presiding over his life, for his imagination had not yet extricated itself from the sense of mystery in the child's sudden presence, and had formed no conjectures of ordinary natural means by which the event could have been brought about. But there was a cry on the hearth. The child had awaked, and Marner stooped to lift it on his knee. It clung round his neck, and burst louder and louder into that mingling of inarticulate cries with, Mammy, by which little children express the bewilderment of waking. Silas pressed it to him, and almost unconsciously uttered sounds of hushing tenderness, while he bethought himself that some of his porridge, which had got cool by the dying fire, would do to feed the child with, if it were only warmed up a little. He had plenty to do through the next hour. The porridge, sweetened with some dry brown sugar from an old store which he had refrained from using for himself, stopped the cries of the little one and made her lift her blue eyes with a wide, quiet gaze at Silas, as he put the spoon in her mouth. Presently she slipped from his knee and began to toddle about, 
but with a pretty stagger that made Silas jump up and follow her, lest she should fall against anything that would hurt her. But she only fell in a sitting posture on the ground, and began to pull at her boots, looking up at him with a crying face, as if the boots hurt her. He took her on his knee again, but it was some time before it occurred to Silas's dull bachelor mind that the wet boots were the grievance, pressing on her warm ankles. He got them off with difficulty, and Baby was at once happily occupied with the primary mystery of her own toes, inviting Silas, with much chuckling, to consider the mystery too. But the wet boots had at last suggested to Silas that the child had been walking on the snow, and this roused him from his entire oblivion of any ordinary means by which it could have entered or been brought into his house. Under the prompting of this new idea, and without waiting to form conjectures, he raised the child in his arms, and went to the door. As soon as he had opened it, there was the cry of, Mammy! again, which Silas had not heard since the child's first hungry waking. Bending forward, he could just discern the marks made by the little feet on the virgin snow, and he followed their track to the furze bushes. Mammy! The little one cried again and again, stretching itself forward so as almost to escape from Silas's arms, before he himself was aware that there was something more than the bush before him, that there was a human body with the head sunk low in the furs and half covered with the shaken snow. End of chapter 12「it was after the early supper-time at the Red House, and the entertainment was in that stage when bashfulness itself had passed into easy jollity, when gentlemen, conscious of unusual accomplishments, could at length be prevailed on to dance a hornpipe, and when the squire preferred talking loudly, scattering snuff, and patting his visitors' backs, to sitting longer at the whist-table, a choice exasperating to Uncle Kimball, who, being always volatile in sober business hours, became intense and bitter over cards and brandy, shuffled before his adversary's deal with a glare of suspicion, and turned up a mean trump card with an air of inexpressible disgust, as if in a world where such things could happen one might as well enter on a course of reckless profligacy. When the evening had advanced to this pitch of freedom and enjoyment, it was usual for the servants, the heavy duties of supper being well over, to get their share of amusement by coming to look on at the dancing, so that the back regions of the house were left in solitude. There were two doors by which the white parlour was entered from the hall, and they were both standing open for the sake of air, but the lower one was crowded with the servants and villagers, and only the upper doorway was left free. Bob Cass was figuring in a hornpipe, and his father, very proud of this lithe son, whom he repeatedly declared to be just like himself in his young days, in a tone that implied this to be the very highest stamp of juvenile merit, was the centre of a group who had placed themselves opposite the performer, not far from the upper door. Godfrey was standing a little way off, not to admire his brother's dancing, but to keep sight of Nancy, who was seated in the group near her father. He stood aloof, because he wished to avoid suggesting himself as a subject for the squire's fatherly jokes in connection with matrimony and Miss Nancy Lammeter's beauty, which were likely to become more and more explicit. But he had the prospect of dancing with her again when the hornpipe was concluded, and in the meanwhile it was very pleasant to get long glances at her quite unobserved. But when Godfrey was lifting his eyes from one of those long glances, they encountered an object as startling to him at that moment as if it had been an apparition from the dead. It was an apparition from that hidden life which lies, like a dark by-street, behind the goodly ornamented façade that meets the sunlight and the gaze of respectable admirers. It was his own child, carried in Silas Marner's arms. 
That was his instantaneous impression, unaccompanied by doubt, though he had not seen the child for months past, and when the hope was rising that he might possibly be mistaken, Mr. Crackenthorpe and Mr. Lameter had already advanced to Silas, in astonishment at this strange advent. Godfrey joined them immediately, unable to rest without hearing every word, trying to control himself, but conscious that if any one noticed him, they must see that he was white-lipped and trembling. But now all eyes at that end of the room were bent on Silas Marner. The squire himself had risen, and asked angrily, "'How's this? What's this? What do you do coming here in this way?' "'I've come for the doctor. I want the doctor,' Silas had said, in the first moment, to Mr. Crackenthorpe. "'Why, what's the matter, Marner?' said the rector. "'The doctor's here, but say quietly what you want him for.' "'It's a woman,' said Silas, speaking low and half breathlessly, just as Godfrey came up. "'She's dead, I think, dead in the snow at the stone pits, not far from my door.' Godfrey felt a great throb. There was one terror in his mind at that moment. It was that the woman might not be dead." That was an evil terror, an ugly inmate to have found a nestling place in Godfrey's kindly disposition, but no disposition is a security from evil wishes to a man whose happiness hangs on duplicity. "'Hush, hush!' said Mr. Crackenthorpe. "'Go out into the hall there. I'll fetch the doctor to you. Found a woman in the snow, and thinks she's dead,' he added, speaking low to the squire. "'Better say as little about it as possible. It will shock the ladies.' Just tell them a poor woman is ill from cold and hunger. I'll go and fetch Kimball. By this time, however, the ladies had pressed forward, curious to know what could have brought the solitary linen weaver there under such strange circumstances, and interested in the pretty child, who, half alarmed and half attracted by the brightness and the numerous company, now frowned and hid her face, now lifted up her head again and looked round placably, until a touch or a coaxing word brought back the frown, and made her bury her face with a new determination. "'What child is it?' said several ladies at once, and, among the rest, Nancy Lameter, addressing Godfrey. "'I don't know. Some poor woman's who's been found in the snow, I believe,' was the answer Godfrey wrung from himself with a terrible effort. "'After all, am I certain?' he hastened to add, silently, in anticipation of his own conscience. "'Why, you'd better leave the child here, then, Master Marner,' said good-natured Mrs. Kimball, hesitating, however, to take those dingy clothes into contact with her own ornamented satin bodice. "'I'll tell one of the girls to fetch it.' "'No, no, I can't part with it. I can't let it go,' said Silas, abruptly. "'It's come to me. I've a right to keep it.' The proposition to take the child from him had come to Silas quite unexpectedly, and his speech, uttered under a strong sudden impulse, was almost like a revelation to himself. A minute before he had no distinct intention about the child. "'Did you ever hear the like?' said Mrs. Kimball, in mild surprise, to her neighbour. "'Now, ladies, I must trouble you to stand aside,' said Mr. Kimball, coming from the card-room, in some bitterness at the interruption, but drilled by the long habit of his profession into obedience to unpleasant calls, even when he was hardly sober. "'It's a nasty business turning out now, eh, Kimball?' said the squire. "'He might a gone for your young fellow, the prentice there. What's his name?' "'Might? Ay, what's the use of talking about might?' growled Uncle Kimball hastening out with Marner, and followed by Mr. Crackenthorpe and Godfrey. "'Get me a pair of thick boots, Godfrey, will you? And stay, let somebody run to Winthrop's and fetch Dolly. She's the best woman to get. Ben was here himself before supper. Is he gone?' "'Yes, sir. I met him,' said Marner. "'But I couldn't stop to tell him anything. Only said I was going for the doctor, and he said the doctor was at the squire's. And I made haste and ran, and there was nobody to be seen at the back of the house, and so I went in to where the company was.' The child, no longer distracted by the bright light and the smiling women's faces, began to cry and call for Mammy, though always clinging to Marner, who had apparently won her thorough confidence. Godfrey had come back with the boots, and felt the cry as if some fibre were drawn tight within him. "'I'll go,' he said, hastily, eager for some movement. "'I'll go and fetch the woman, Mrs. Winthrop.' 
"'Oh, Pooh, send somebody else,' said Uncle Kimball, hurrying away with Marner. "'You'll let me know if I can be of any use, Kimball,' said Mr. Crackenthorpe. But the doctor was out of hearing. Godfrey, too, had disappeared. He was gone to snatch his hat and coat, having just reflection enough to remember that he must not look like a madman, but he rushed out of the house into the snow without heeding his thin shoes. In a few minutes he was on his rapid way to the stone pits by the side of Dolly, who, though feeling that she was entirely in her place in encountering cold and snow on an errand of mercy, was much concerned at a young gentleman's getting his feet wet under a like impulse. "'You'd a deal better go back, sir,' said Dolly, with respectful compassion. "'You've no call to catch cold, and I'd ask you if you'd be so good as to tell my husband to come on your way back. He's at the rainbow, I doubt, if you found him any way sober enough to be a use. Or else there's Mrs. Snell that happened to send the boy up to fetch and carry, for there may be things wanted from the doctors.' "'No, I'll stay, now I'm once out. I'll stay outside here,' said Godfrey, when they came opposite Marner's cottage. "'You can come and tell me if I can do anything.' "'Well, sir, you're very good. You've a tender heart,' said Dolly, going to the door. Godfrey was too painfully preoccupied to feel a twinge of self-reproach at this undeserved praise. He walked up and down, unconscious that he was plunging ankle-deep in snow, unconscious of everything but trembling suspense about what was going on in the cottage, and the effect of each alternative on his future lot. No, not quite unconscious of everything else. Deeper down, and half smothered by passionate desire and dread, there was the sense that he ought not to be waiting on these alternatives, that he ought to accept the consequences of his deeds, own the miserable wife, and fulfil the claims of the helpless child. But he had not moral courage enough to contemplate that active renunciation of Nancy as possible for him. He had only conscience and heart enough to make him for ever uneasy under the weakness that forbade the renunciation. And at this moment his mind leaped away from all restraint toward the sudden prospect of deliverance from his long bondage. "'Is she dead?' said the voice that predominated over every other within him. "'If she is, I may marry Nancy, and then I shall be a good fellow in future, and have no secrets, and the child shall be taken care of somehow.' But across that vision came the other possibility. "'She may live, and then it's all up with me.' Godfrey never knew how long it was before the door of the cottage opened and Mr. Kimball came out. He went forward to meet his uncle, prepared to suppress the agitation he must feel, whatever news he was to hear. "'I waited for you, as I'd come so far,' he said, speaking first. "'Pooh! It was nonsense for you to come out. Why didn't you send one of the men? There's nothing to be done. She's dead. Has been dead for hours, I should say.' "'What sort of woman is she?' said Godfrey, feeling the blood rush to his face. "'A young woman, but emaciated, with long black hair, some vagrant, quite in rags. She's got a wedding ring on, however. They must fetch her away to the workhouse to-morrow. Come, come along.' "'I want to look at her,' said Godfrey. "'I think I saw such a woman yesterday. I'll overtake you in a minute or two. Mr. Kimball went on, and Godfrey turned back to the cottage. He cast only one glance at the dead face on the pillow, which Dolly had smoothed with decent care, but he remembered that last look at his unhappy hated wife so well that at the end of sixteen years every line in the worn face was present to him when he told the full story of this night. He turned immediately toward the hearth, where Silas Marner sat lulling the child. She was perfectly quiet now, but not asleep only soothed by sweet porridge and warmth into that wide-gazing calm which makes us older human beings, with our inward turmoil, feel a certain awe in the presence of a little child, such as we feel before some quiet majesty or beauty in the earth or sky, before a steady glowing planet, or a full-flowered eglantine, or the bending trees over a silent pathway. The wide-open blue eyes looked up at Godfrey's without any uneasiness or sign of recognition. The child could make no visible, audible claim on its father, and the father felt a strange mixture of feelings, a conflict of regret and joy, that the pulse of that little heart had no response for the half-jealous yearning in his own, when the blue eyes turned away from him slowly and fixed themselves on the weaver's queer face, which was bent down low to look at them 
while the small hand began to pull Marner's withered cheek with loving disfiguration. "'You'll take the child to the parish to-morrow?' asked Godfrey, speaking as indifferently as he could. "'Who says so?' said Marner, sharply. "'Will they make me take her?' "'Why, you wouldn't like to keep her, should you, an old bachelor like you?' "'Till anybody shows they've a right to take her away from me,' said Marner. "'The mother's dead, and I reckon it's got no father. It's a lone thing, and I'm a lone thing. My money's gone, I don't know where, and this is come from I don't know where. I know nothing.' I'm partly mazed. Poor little thing, said Godfrey. Let me give something towards finding it clothes. He had put his hand in his pocket and found half a guinea, and, thrusting it into Silas's hand, he hurried out of the cottage to overtake Mr. Kimball. Ah, I see it's not the same woman I saw, he said, as he came up. It's a pretty little child. The old fellow seems to want to keep it. That's strange for a miser like him. But I gave him a trifle to help him out. The parish isn't likely to quarrel with him for the right to keep the child. No, but I've seen the time when I might have quarrelled with him for it myself. It's too late now, though. If the child ran into the fire, your aunt's too fat to overtake it. She could only sit and grunt like an alarmed sow. But what a fool you are, Godfrey, to come out in your dancing shoes and stockings in this way, and you one of the bows of the evening, and at your own house— "'What do you mean by such freaks, young fellow? "'Has Miss Nancy been cruel, "'and do you want to spite her by spoiling your pumps?' "'Oh, everything has been disagreeable to-night. "'I was tired to death of jigging and gallanting "'and that bother about the hornpipes, "'and I'd got to dance with the other Miss Gunn,' "'said Godfrey, glad of the subterfuge "'his uncle had suggested to him. "'The prevarication and white lies, which a mind that keeps itself ambitiously pure, is as uneasy under as a great artist, under the false touches that no eye detects but his own, are worn as lightly as mere trimmings, when once the actions have become a lie. Godfrey reappeared in the white parlour with dry feet, and, since the truth must be told, with a sense of relief and gladness, that was too strong for painful thoughts to struggle with. For could he not venture now, whenever opportunity offered, to say the tenderest things to Nancy Lammeter, to promise her and himself that he would always be just what she would desire to see him? There was no danger that his dead wife would be recognized, those were not days of active inquiry and wide report, and as for the registry of their marriage, that was a long way off, buried in unturned pages, away from every one's interest but his own. Dunsey might betray him if he came back, but Dunsey might be one to silence. And when events turn out so much better for a man than he has had reason to dread, is it not a proof that his conduct has been less foolish and blameworthy than it might otherwise have appeared? When we are treated well, we naturally begin to think that we are not altogether unmeritorious, and that it is only just we should treat ourselves well and not mar our own good fortune." Where, after all, would be the use of his confessing the past to Nancy Lammeter, and throwing away his happiness, nay hers, for he felt some confidence that she loved him? As for the child, he would see that it was cared for, he would never forsake it, he would do everything but own it. Perhaps it would be just as happy in life without being owned by its father, seeing that nobody could tell how things would turn out, and that, is there any other reason wanted? Well, then, that the father would be much happier without owning the child. End of chapter 13「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Silas Marner, The Weaver of Ravelo, by George Eliot. Chapter 14 There was a pauper's burial that week in Ravelo, and up Kench Yard at Batherley it was known that the dark-haired woman with the fair child, who had lately come to lodge there, was gone away again. That was all the express note taken that Molly had disappeared from the eyes of men. But the unwept death which, to the general lot, seemed as trivial as the summer shed leaf, was charged with the force of destiny to certain human lives that we know of, shaping their joys and sorrows, even to the end. 
Silas Marner's determination to keep the tramp's child was matter of hardly less surprise and iterated talk in the village than the robbery of his money. That softening of feeling towards him which dated from his misfortune, that merging of suspicion and dislike, in a rather contemptuous pity for him as lone and crazy, was now accompanied with a more active sympathy, especially amongst the women. Notable mothers, who knew what it was to keep children whole and sweet, lazy mothers, who knew what it was to be interrupted in folding their arms and scratching their elbows by the mischievous propensities of children just firm on their legs, were equally interested in conjecturing how a lone man would manage with a two-year-old child on his hands, and were equally ready with their suggestions, the notable chiefly telling him what he had better do, and the lazy ones being emphatic in telling him what he would never be able to do. Among the notable mothers, Dolly Winthrop was the one whose neighborly offices were the most acceptable to Marner, for they were rendered without any show of bustling instruction. Silas had shown her the half-guinea given to him by Godfrey, and had asked her what he should do about getting some clothes for the child. "'Eh, hey, Master Marner,' said Dolly, "'there's no call to buy, no more nor a pair of shoes, for I've got the little petticoats as Aaron wore five years ago, and it's ill spending the money on them baby clothes, for the child'll grow like grass in May, bless it, that it will.' And the same day Dolly brought her bundle, and displayed to Marner, one by one, the tiny garments in their due order of succession, most of them patched and darned, but clean and neat as fresh-sprung herbs. This was the introduction to a great ceremony with soap and water, from which Baby came out in new beauty, and sat on Dolly's knee, handling her toes and chuckling and patting her palms together with an air of having made several discoveries about herself, which she communicated by alternate sounds of guck 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 and mammy. The mammy was not a cry of need or uneasiness, Baby had been used to utter it, without expecting either tender sound or touch to follow. "'Anybody'd think the angels in heaven couldn't be prettier,' said Dolly, rubbing the golden curls and kissing them. "'And to think of its being covered with them dirty rags, and the poor mother froze to death, but there's them as took care of it, and brought it to your door, Master Marner. The door was open, and it walked in over the snow, like as if it had been a little starved robin. Didn't you say the door was open?' Yes, said Silas, meditatively. Yes, the door was open. The money's gone I don't know where, and this is come from I don't know where. He had not mentioned to any one his unconsciousness of the child's entrance, shrinking from questions which might lead to the fact he himself suspected, namely, that he had been in one of his trances. Ah, said Dolly, with soothing gravity, it's like the night and the morning, and the sleeping and the waking, and the rain and the harvest. One goes and the other comes, and we know nothing how nor where. We may strive and scratch and fend, but it's little we can do utter all. The big things come and go, with no striving o' ourn. They do, that they do. And I think you're in the right on it, to keep the little un, Master Marner, seeing as it's been sent to you, though there's folks as think different. You'll happen be a bit moithered with it while it's so little." "'But I'll come, and welcome, and see to it for you. "'I've a bit of time to spare most days, "'for when one gets up betimes in the morning, "'the clock seems to stand still toward ten, "'afore it's time to go about the victual. "'So, as I say, I'll come and see to the child for you, and welcome.' "'Thank you. Kindly,' said Silas, hesitating a little. "'I'll be glad if you'll tell me things. "'But—' he added uneasily, leaning forward to look at Baby with some jealousy, as she was resting her head backward against Dolly's arm, and eyeing him contentedly from a distance. "'But I want to do things for it myself, else it may get fond of somebody else, and not fond of me. I've been used to fending for myself in the house. I can learn. I can learn.' "'Eh, to be sure,' said Dolly, gently. "'I've seen men as are wonderful handy with children. "'The men are awkward and contrary, mostly, God help em, "'but when the drink's out of em, they aren't unsensible, "'though they're bad for leeching and bandaging, "'so fiery and unpatient. "'You see, this goes first, next the skin,' proceeded Dolly, "'taking up the little shirt and putting it on. "'Yes,' said Marner, docilely, bringing his eyes very close, that they might be initiated in the mysteries, whereupon Baby seized his head with both her small arms, and put her lips against his face, with purring noises. 
"'See there,' said Dolly, with a woman's tender tact. "'She's fondest of you. She wants to go on your lap, I'll be bound. Go, then, take her, Master Marner. You can put the things on, and then you can say as you've done for her from the first of her coming to you.' Marner took her on his lap, trembling with an emotion mysterious to himself, at something unknown dawning on his life. Thought and feeling were so confused within him that if he had tried to give them utterance, he could only have said that the child was come instead of the gold, that the gold had turned into the child. He took the garments from Dolly and put them on under her teaching, interrupted, of course, by baby's gymnastics. "'There, then, why you take to it quite easy, Master Marner,' said Dolly. "'But what shall you do when you're forced to sit in your loom?' "'For she'll get busier and mischievouser every day. "'She will, bless her. "'It's lucky as you've got that high hearth instead of a grate, "'for that keeps the fire more out of her reach. "'But if you've got anything as can be spilt or broke, "'or as is fit to cut her fingers off, she'll be at it, "'and it is but right you should know.' "'Silas meditated a little while in some perplexity. "'I'll tie her to the leg of the loom,' he said at last. "'Tie her with a good long strip of something.' "'Well, mayhap that'll do, as it's a little girl, for they're easier persuaded to sit in one place, nor the lads. I know what the lads are, for I've had four, four I've had, God knows, and if you was to take and tie em up, they'd make a fighting and a crying as if you was ringing the pigs. But I'll bring you my little chair, and some bits of red rag and things for her to play with, and she'll sit and chatter to em as if they was alive. Eh, if it wasn't a sin to the lads to wish em made different, bless em, I should have been glad for one of em to be a little gal, and to think as I could a taught her to scour, and mend, and the knitting, and everything. But I can teach em this little un, Master Marner, when she gets old enough. "'But she'll be my little un,' said Marner, rather hastily. "'She'll be nobody else's.' "'No, to be sure, you'll have a right to her if you're a father to her, and bring her up according. But—' added Dolly, coming to a point which she had determined beforehand to touch upon. "'You must bring her up like christened folks' children, and take her to church, and let her learn her catechise, as my little Aaron can say off, the I believe, and everything, and hurt nobody by word or deed, as well as if he was the clerk. That's what you must do, Master Marner, if you'd do the right thing by the orphan child.' Marner's pale face flushed suddenly under a new anxiety. His mind was too busy trying to give some definite bearing to Dolly's words for him to think of answering her. "'And it's my belief,' she went on, "'as the poor little creature has never been christened, and it's nothing but right as the parson should be spoke to. And if you was no ways unwilling, I'd talk to Mr. Macy about it this very day. For if the child ever went any ways wrong, and you hadn't done your part by it, Master Marner, inoculation and everything to save it from harm, it'd be a thorn in your bed for ever this side of the grave, and I can't think as it'd be easy lying down for anybody when they'd got to another world, if they hadn't done their part by the helpless children as come without their own asking. Dolly herself was disposed to be silent for some time now, for she had spoken from the depths of her own simple belief and was much concerned to know whether her words would produce the desired effect on Silas. He was puzzled and anxious, for Dolly's word, christened, conveyed no distinct meaning to him. He had only heard of baptism, and he had only seen the baptism of grown-up men and women. "'What is it you mean by christened?' he said at last, timidly. "'Won't folks be good to her without it?' "'Dear, dear, Master Marner,' said Dolly, with gentle distress and compassion, "'Had you never no father nor mother as taught you to say your prayers, "'and as there's good words and good things to keep us from harm?' "'Yes,' said Silas, in a low voice. "'I know a deal about that. "'Used to, used to, but your ways are different. "'My country was a good way off.' "'He paused for a few moments, and then added, more decidedly, "'But I want to do everything as can be done for the child, "'and whatever's right for it in this country, and you think'll do it good, I'll act according, if you'll tell me. "'Well, then, Master Marner,' said Dolly, inwardly rejoiced, "'I'll ask Mr. Macy to speak to the parson about it, "'and you must fix on a name for it, "'because it must have a name give it when it's christened.' "'My mother's name was Hepzibah,' said Silas, "'and my little sister was named after her.' "'Eh, hey, that's a hard name,' said Dolly. "'I partly think it isn't a christened name.' "'It's a Bible name,' said Silas, 
old ideas recurring. "'Then I've no call to speak again it,' said Dolly, rather startled by Silas's knowledge on this head. "'But you see I'm no scholard, and I'm slow at catching the words. My husband says I'm always like as if I was putting the half for the handle. That's what he says, for he's very sharp, God help him. But it was awkward calling your little sister by such a hard name, when you'd got nothing big to say, like, wasn't it, Master Marner?' "'We called her Eppie, said Silas. "'Well, if it was no ways wrong to shorten the name, it'd be a deal handier. And so I'll go now, Master Marner, and I'll speak about the christening afore dark, and I wish you the best o' luck, and it's my belief as it'll come to you, if you do what's right by the orphan child. And there's the noculation to be seen to, and as to washing its bits o' things, you need to look but nobody but me, for I can do em of one hand while I've got my suds about. Eh, the blessed angel!' You'll let me bring my heir in one of these days, and he'll show her his little cart, as his father's made for him, and the black and white pup as he's got a rearing. Baby was christened, the rector deciding that a double baptism was the lesser risk to incur, and on this occasion Silas, making himself as clean and tidy as he could, appeared for the first time within the church, and shared in the observances held sacred by his neighbours. He was quite unable, by means of anything he heard or saw, to identify the Ravelo religion with his old faith. If he could at any time in his previous life have done so, it must have been by the aid of a strong feeling ready to vibrate with sympathy, rather than by a comparison of phrases and ideas. And now, for long years, that feeling had been dormant. He had no distinct idea about the baptism and the church-going, except that Dolly had said it was for the good of the child— and in this way, as the weeks grew to months, the child created fresh and fresh links between his life and the lives from which he had hitherto shrunk continually into narrower isolation. Unlike the gold which needed nothing, and must be worshipped in close-locked solitude, which was hidden away from the daylight and deaf to the songs of birds, and started to no human tones, Eppy was a creature of endless claims and ever-growing desires, seeking and loving sunshine, and living sounds, and living movements, making trial of everything, with trust in new joy, and stirring the human kindness in all eyes that looked on her. The gold had kept his thoughts in an ever-repeated circle, leading to nothing beyond itself, but Eppy was an object compacted of changes and hopes that forced his thoughts onward, and carried them far away from their old eager pacing towards the same blank limit, carried them away to the new things that would come with the coming years, when Eppie would have learned to understand how her father Silas cared for her, and made him look for images of that time in the ties and charities that bound together the families of his neighbours. The gold had asked that he should sit weaving longer and longer, deafened and blinded more and more to all things except the monotony of his loom and the repetition of his web, but Eppie called him away from his weaving, and made him think all its pauses a holiday, reawakening his senses with her fresh life, even to the old winter flies that came crawling forth in the early spring sunshine, and warming him into joy because she had joy. And when the sunshine grew strong and lasting, so that the buttercups were thick in the meadows, Silas might be seen in the sunny midday, or in the late afternoon when the shadows were lengthening under the hedgerows, strolling out with uncovered head to carry Eppy beyond the stone pits to where the flowers grew, till they reached some favourite bank where he could sit down, while Eppy toddled to pluck the flowers, and make remarks to the winged things that murmured happily above the bright petals, calling, Dad, Dad's! attention continually by bringing him the flowers. Then she would turn her ear to some sudden bird-note, and Silas learned to please her by making signs of hushed stillness, that they might listen for the note to come again, so that when it came, she set up her small back and laughed with gurgling triumph. Sitting on the banks in this way, Silas began to look for the once familiar herbs again, and as the leaves, with their unchanged outline and markings, lay on his palm, there was a sense of crowding remembrances from which he turned away timidly, taking refuge in Eppie's little world, that lay lightly on his enfeebled spirit. As the child's mind was growing into knowledge, his mind was growing into memory. As her life unfolded, his soul, long stupefied in a cold narrow prison, was unfolding too, and trembling gradually into full consciousness. It was an influence which must gather force with every new year. The tones that stirred Silas's heart grew articulate, and called for more distinct answers. 
shapes and sounds grew clearer for Eppie's eyes and ears, and there was more that Dad-Dad was imperatively required to notice and account for. Also, by the time Eppie was three years old, she developed a fine capacity for mischief, and for devising ingenious ways of being troublesome, which found much exercise, not only for Silas's patience, but for his watchfulness and penetration. Sorely was poor Silas puzzled on such occasions by the incompatible demands of love. Dolly Winthrop told him that punishment was good for Eppie, and that, as for rearing a child without making it tingle a little in soft and safe places now and then, it was not to be done. "'To be sure, there's another thing you might do, Master Marner,' added Dolly meditatively. "'You might shut her up once in the coal-hole. That's what I did with Aaron, for I was that silly with the youngest lad as I could never bear to smack him. Not as I could find in my heart to let him stay in the coal-hole more nor a minute, but it was enough to collie him all over, so as he must be new-washed and dressed, and it was as good as a rod to him, that was.' "'But I put it upon your conscience, Master Marner, as there's one of em you must choose, either smacking or the coal-hole, else she'll get so masterful there'll be no holding her.' Silas was impressed with the melancholy truth of this last remark, but his force of mind failed before the only two penal methods open to him, not only because it was painful to him to hurt Eppie, but because he trembled at a moment's contention with her, lest she should love him the less for it. Let even an affectionate Goliath get himself tied to a small tender thing, dreading to hurt it by pulling, and dreading still more to snap the cord, and which of the two, pray, will be master? It was clear that Eppie, with her short, toddling steps, must lead Father Silas a pretty dance on any fine morning when circumstances favoured mischief. For example, he had wisely chosen a broad strip of linen as a means of fastening her to his loom when he was busy. It made a broad belt round her waist, and it was long enough to allow of her reaching the truckle-bed and sitting down on it, but not long enough for her to attempt any dangerous climbing. One bright summer's morning Silas had been more engrossed than usual in setting up a new piece of work, an occasion on which his scissors were in requisition. These scissors— owing to an especial warning of Dolly's, had been kept carefully out of Eppie's reach, but the click of them had had a peculiar attraction for her ear, and watching the results of that click, she had derived the philosophic lesson that the same cause would produce the same effect. Silas had seated himself in his loom, and the noise of weaving had begun, but he had left his scissors on a ledge which Eppie's arm was long enough to reach, and now— like a small mouse, watching her opportunity, she stole quietly from her corner, secured the scissors, and toddled to the bed again, setting up her back as a mode of concealing the fact. She had a distinct intention as to the use of the scissors, and having cut the linen strip in a jagged but effectual manner, in two moments she had run out of the open door where the sunshine was inviting her, while poor Silas believed her to be a better child than usual. It was not until he happened to need his scissors that the terrible fact burst upon him. Eppie had run out by herself, had perhaps fallen into the stone-pit. Silas, shaken by the worst fear that could have befallen him, rushed out, calling, Eppie! and ran eagerly about the unenclosed space, exploring the dry cavities into which she might have fallen, and then gazing with questioning dread at the smooth red surface of the water. The cold drops stood on his brow. How long had she been out? There was one hope, that she had crept through the stile and got into the fields, where he habitually took her to stroll. But the grass was high in the meadow, and there was no descrying her, if she were there, except by a close search that would be a trespass on Mr. Osgood's crop. Still, that misdemeanor must be committed, and poor Silas, after peering all round the hedgerows, traversed the grass, beginning with perturbed vision to see Eppie behind every group of red sorrel, and to see her moving always farther off as he approached. The meadow was searched in vain, and he got over the stile into the next field, looking with dying hope towards a small pond which was now reduced to its summer shallowness, so as to leave a wide margin of good adhesive mud. Here, however, sat Eppie, discoursing cheerfully to her own small boot, which she was using as a bucket to convey the water into a deep hoof-mark, while her little naked foot was planted comfortably on a cushion of olive-green mud. A red-headed calf was observing her with alarmed doubt through the opposite hedge. Here was clearly a case of aberration in a christened child which demanded severe treatment, but Silas, 
overcome with convulsive joy at finding his treasure again, could do nothing but snatch her up and cover her with half-sobbing kisses. It was not until he had carried her home, and had begun to think of the necessary washing, that he recollected the need that he should punish Eppie, and make her remember. The idea that she might run away again and come to harm gave him unusual resolution, and for the first time he determined to try the coal-hole, a small closet near the hearth. "'Naughty, naughty Eppie,' he suddenly began, holding her on his knee, and pointing to her muddy feet and clothes. "'Naughty to cut with the scissors and run away. Eppie must go into the coal-hole for being naughty. Daddy must put her in the coal-hole.' He half expected that this would be shock enough, and that Eppie would begin to cry. But instead of that, she began to shake herself on his knee, as if the proposition opened a pleasing novelty. Seeing that he must proceed to extremities, he put her into the coal-hole, and held the door closed, with a trembling sense that he was using a strong measure. For a moment there was silence, but then came a little cry, "'Opie! Opie!' and Silas let her out again, saying, "'Now Eppie'll never be naughty again, else she must go in the coal-hole, a black naughty place.' The weaving must stand still a long while this morning, for now Eppie must be washed and have clean clothes on, but it was to be hoped that this punishment would have a lasting effect, and save time in future, though perhaps it would have been better if Eppie had cried more. In half an hour she was clean again, and Silas, having turned his back to see what he could do with the linen band, threw it down again, with the reflection that Eppie would be good without fastening for the rest of the morning. He turned round again, and was going to place her in her little chair near the loom, when she peeped out at him with a black face and hands again, and said, "'Eppie in the tall hole This total failure of the coal-hole discipline shook Silas's belief in the efficacy of punishment. "'She'd take it all for fun,' he observed to Dolly, "'if I didn't hurt her. And that I can't do, Mrs. Winthrop. If she makes me a bit of trouble, I can bear it and she's got no tricks but what she'll grow out of. "'Well, that's partly true, Master Marner,' said Dolly, sympathetically, "'and if you can't bring your mind to frighten her off touching things, you must do what you can to keep em out of her way. That's what I do with the pups, as the lads are always a-rearing. They will worry and gnaw, worry and gnaw they will, if it was one Sunday cap as hung anywhere so as they could drag it. They know no difference, God help em. It's the pushing of the teeth as sets em on, that's what it is.' So Eppie was reared without punishment, the burden of her misdeeds being borne vicariously by Father Silas. The stone hut was made a soft nest for her, lined with downy patience, and also in the world that lay beyond the stone hut she knew nothing of frowns and denials. Notwithstanding the difficulty of carrying her and his yarn or linen at the same time, Silas took her with him in most of his journeys to the farmhouses, unwilling to leave her behind at Dolly Winthrop's, who was always ready to take care of her, and little curly-headed Eppie, the weaver's child, became an object of interest at several outlying homesteads, as well as in the village. Hitherto he had been treated very much as if he had been a useful gnome or brownie, a queer and unaccountable creature, who must necessarily be looked at with wondering curiosity and repulsion, and with whom one would be glad to make all greetings and bargains as brief as possible, but who must be dealt with in a propitiatory way, and occasionally have a present of pork or garden stuff to carry home with him, seeing that without him there was no getting the yarn woven. But now Silas met with open, smiling faces, and cheerful questioning, as a person whose satisfactions and difficulties could be understood. Everywhere he must sit a little, and talk about the child, and words of interest were always ready for him. "'Ah, Master Marner, you'll be lucky if she takes the measles soon and easy,' or, "'Why, there isn't any lone men that have been wishing to take up with a little un like that, but I reckon the weaving makes you handier than men as do outdoor work. You're partly as handy as a woman, for weaving comes next to spinning.' Elderly masters and mistresses, seated observantly in large kitchen armchairs, shook their heads over the difficulties attendant on rearing children, felt Eppie's round arms and legs, and pronounced them remarkably firm, and told Silas that, if she turned out well, which, however, there was no telling, it would be a fine thing for him to have a steady lass to do for him when he got helpless. Servant maidens were fond of carrying her out to look at the hens and chickens, or to see if any cherries could be shaken down in the orchard, 
and the small boys and girls approached her slowly, with cautious movement and steady gaze, like little dogs face to face with one of their own kind, till attraction had reached the point at which the soft lips were put out for a kiss. No child was afraid of approaching Silas when Eppie was near him. There was no repulsion around him now, either for young or old, for the little child had come to link him once more with the whole world. There was love between him and the child that blent them into one, and there was love between the child and the world, from men and women with parental looks and tones, to the red ladybirds and the round pebbles. Silas began now to think of Ravelo life entirely in relation to Eppie. She must have everything that was good in Ravelo, and he listened docilely, that he might come to understand better what this life was, from which, for fifteen years, he had stood aloof as from a strange thing, with which he could have no communion, as some man who has a precious plant to which he would give a nurturing home in a new soil, thinks of the rain, and the sunshine, and all influences, in relation to his nursling, and asks industriously for all knowledge that will help him to satisfy the wants of the surging roots, or to guard leaf and bud from invading harm. The disposition to hoard had been utterly crushed at the very first by the loss of his long-stored gold. The coins he earned afterwards seemed as irrelevant as stones brought to complete a house suddenly buried by an earthquake. The sense of bereavement was too heavy upon him for the old thrill of satisfaction to arise again at the touch of the newly earned coin." and now something had come to replace his hoard, which gave a growing purpose to the earnings, drawing his hope and joy continually onward, beyond the money. In old days there were angels who came and took men by the hand, and led them away from the city of destruction. We see no white-winged angels now, but yet men are led away from threatening destruction. A hand is put into theirs, which leads them forth gently towards a calm and bright land, so that they look no more backward and the hand may be a little child's. End of chapter 14「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Silas Marner, The Weaver of Ravelo, by George Eliot. Chapter 15 There was one person, as you will believe, who watched with keener, though more hidden interest than any other, the prosperous growth of Epi under the weaver's care. He dared not do anything that would imply a stronger interest in a poor man's adopted child than could be expected from the kindliness of the young squire, when a chance meeting suggested a little present to a simple old fellow whom others noticed with good will. But he told himself that the time would come when he might do something towards furthering the welfare of his daughter without incurring suspicion. Was he very uneasy in the meantime at his inability to give his daughter her birthright? I cannot say that he was. The child was being taken care of, and would very likely be happy, as people in humble stations often were, happier, perhaps, than those brought up in luxury. That famous ring that pricked its owner when he forgot duty and followed desire, I wonder if it pricked very hard when he set out on the chase, or whether it pricked but lightly then, and only pierced to the quick when the chase had long been ended, and hope, folding her wings, looked backward, and became regret. Godfrey Cass's cheek and eye were brighter than ever now. He was so undivided in his aims that he seemed like a man of firmness. No Dunsey had come back. People had made up their minds that he was gone for a soldier, or gone out of the country, and no one cared to be specific in their inquiries on a subject delicate to a respectable family. Godfrey had ceased to see the shadow of Dunsey across his path, and the path now lay straight forward to the accomplishment of his best, long-cherished wishes. Everybody said Mr. Godfrey had taken the right turn, and it was pretty clear what would be the end of things, for there were not many days in the week that he was not seen riding to the Warrens. Godfrey himself, when he was asked jocosely if the day had been fixed, smiled with the pleasant consciousness of a lover who could say yes, if he liked. He felt a reformed man, delivered from temptation, and the vision of his future life seemed to him as a promised land for which he had no cause to fight. He saw himself with all his happiness centred on his own hearth, 
while Nancy would smile on him as he played with the children. And that other child, not on the hearth, he would not forget it, he would see that it was well provided for. That was a father's duty. End of chapter 15 End of part 1